What are you doing? Am I doing it? Yeah. Oh, you're. Oh, wow. You're okay. I'll give it another. I mean, you weren't really giving me much, Dane. But I was waiting on you to to well, I signal was, me. I was. Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> Are you out of your fucking mind? I'm just gonna leave in the whole okay, the just, whole thing. There. Just use me having that seizure without any uh, effects, and I think that'll even be as interesting. Hey, come on in. Hey, man. Last, I'm coming up with a piece of memorabilia. <laughs> oh, that's great. What's up, man? Hey, dude. I have more in the. Uh... Oh, show the camera. That's well, hey, cool. hi. Oh, hi. Yeah, we're going. Yeah. No, no, no. Shut the couch. Shut the couch. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. And it's a little dusty because it's it's a part of history, so it hasn't moved in some time. Hi. Hey, man. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. This is a great yeah, gift. Why did I? I didn't bring that as a gift. It's uh, one of my minor accomplishments in my career. But I have to have it back up here. It's very dusty. Okay. Which I think would probably bother you, right? You have some pleasure or something? I have this set up. All right. You see? Yeah. Cool. I was really hoping I was going to sit on a whoopee cushion. I kind of was hoping that I was going to sit in here. <laughs> We're the odd couple. I'm telling you, this is a show. Can I? Some of the things that you have set up here are very. I'm like in a hospital bed. I feel like I'm just. I came out of a, some kind of gallbladder situation. Oh, are can you I move this are you behind you? Okay? I feel great. Yeah, let's do it however you want. Just to can I? Okay. I'm good. No, no. I get Rick. I got it, man. I'm sorry. I'm making this a little more difficult. This is your show. I'm on your ride. Fuck it. What's this? Is that holy water? Oh shit! I'm gonna give you hand sanitizer. Yes. <laughs> Peace be with you, and also with you. Sorry, that was holy water. Here you go. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. Ooh, that smells old. I hate the beginning of an interview where you just don't know really know where to settle your body. Like, where's your real comfort zone? And then, uh, if you're in the wrong position, the whole time you're kind of thinking like, I'm breach. I'm coming out wrong. Actually, I do have to go. Bars and tone. Okay, hold on one sec. <laughs> right. Bars someday. and tone. Is this your new album? I'm going to move this. And at some point, maybe some air will probably be hitting me. Ooh. Now, why did you have that in the corner just facing toward the wall? Well, because it's like, so it's not as loud. Oh, I see. Okay. It, it, it is a little loud. It's oscillating, and it's not even oscillating back toward me, which is kind of a, a bummer. Yeah. Does I just, it sound like a, a sold-out crowd at Madison Square Garden from outside? In the Ma Madison, I also played Madison Square Garden which is a smaller arena, but I filled it. You got me. Madskin Square Garden. All right. this. this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Am I doing the commercial voice too much, Betty? <laughs> yes, most of the time. Uh, can I still use that or should I try a non- I'm going to try a non-commercial voice. Tell me how this is, okay? Okay. Hey, how you doing? This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Was that more casual? Yeah, that was really good. And Ricky, you have to make sure that you let the listeners know that they get 10% of their first month at betterhelp.com slash Tyso. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Tyso. I do have a hard out, Rick, in about a minute. Oh. <laughs> I, think I, I think there's a funnier amount of time I could have picked, but there's something funny about the absolute immediacy of a minute. I mean, there's really nothing you could do with a minute. But if I said, like, I got a hard out in 11 minutes... It starts to feel like we're on the giddy up, and are we going? Is yeah, this part this is of it? Great job okay. writing, dude. Keep, keep telling us about this while I uh -huh. new pieces of art. Let's talk about Madison Square Garden a little bit more. Tell me about it. What was yeah, it like selling out Madison Square Garden? <laughs> well, you were like the first comedian to do it after the uh... fifth. Oh yeah. Yeah, Madison, not Madison. Eddie Murphy. Yes, Madison, not Matt, not Madison. George Carlin. George Carlin. Yeah. Dice. And Dice. Dice play. Yeah, Dice. Is there like a, do you have like a little hand towel or something I could just dab or? Yeah, this is a I also have some tea. I brought throat coat. This is clean? I won't need it the whole time. I, I, I don't want to look like a, I mean, you know, <laughs> a black comic. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I wasn't thinking that. I was going to say a, a boxing sideman. I like a little honey with it if you have it. If you don't have it, then fuck it. I don't I want do. it. Ooh, it's warm in the valley here. Is there any way I could hold this fan right on me? Just hold it and I'll trade you. That's the tea. You told me to bring this. You told me you had tea. 
I asked you if you had throat coat, and you then told me I should bring my own. Ah, right. oh, Rick. Dang, this is very cool. Which one is that? This is the album that I really know. Would you like to uh, uh, take your shoes off mug or uh, Mark Marin with the talk mug? Which one do you mind if I throw in a fit of anger? Bars and chimes. <laughs> no, bars and tones. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm, I think I'm okay now. My anxiety, which I had some, to be honest, coming in, has quelled. And now I'm just on your ride. I don't think this is really going to start until the tea is ready. Oh, oh shit. Okay, so, so we we're could, just shooting the shit we, as pals for now. This could be a metaphor, like a lot of times in movies, as the tea kettle starts to boil, tension is rising. But it's a saucepan, Because apparently. there's no tension. And instead we're going to hear some, some blub, blub, blubs. Is that a derogatory term for Italian? I was trying to find a, I, I didn't know, <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I was searching my vernacular to try to, I don't have it, but I do appreciate the tea when I get it. And, uh, and it's great to be here. So Dane, the words, words like vernacular are very much in the, in the Dane Cook zeitgeist. Right. I'm sorry. I can't hear you without the cans. Where am I? Yeah. Oh. Dane. <laughs> Chimes and buzzes. <laughs> no, bars and tones. Bars and tones. Uh, vernacular is a word that you would use because I find you use words. You look for words that have more syllables. Talk on that. I look for words that have more syllables? Like I'm on a word hunt? No. I'm not, no. It's called a word search. Sometimes, sometimes words, uh, uh, I learn a word and then I remember a piece of material and go, oh, that would fit really nicely in there and I, I get it right in. But you like choosing formal words. Like you like to say gala instead of party. I would prefer to say gala, but if it was a party, I would describe it as a party. If it was an upscale party, more of a soiree. Then if it was maybe something shiny people were wearing, I'd go gala. Do me a favor and hear me out for a second. Mm -hmm. With I all sincerity. You, you know that. That's why we're friends to this day. Well, then put the cans on. You want to move on. this? You want, to move, you want me to wear the cans? Well, if you're going to hear me out. I hear you now at this point because now I'm really focused. Do we want the live pure in front of me, my face at this for point? For the audio, for the people at home. For when we start? Once the tea is ready, the fan will be off. Okay. Unless you want it off now, but I'll give you a little extra. No, no, it's good because now it's, uh, I've come out of, a, I was in a little bit of an anxiety. Uh, sp what's a spiral that goes up? I don't know. Find something with three syllables or more. Uh, Chandelof? Yeah, great. That's what I was, but now I'm good. Now I'm like, now I'm Mario level one. Before the ladder, the broken one, the barrels coming at you, the fire, the big donkey monkey. So once we start with the tea and I have a sip of that and we're like into it. I'll tell you, how about once we have, we get you the tea. But I love words. We're going to get you a mushroom tea, okay? What's that? Bigger, Rick? Bars and tone. <laughs> Carpet. Hardwood. Rugs. And luxury vinyl. And we're back. I'm having a, like a little eye twitch. Are you seeing that? You, know, you ever get that? And it feels like your eye is... Yes. On a uh, on a uh, log ride, you know, that's how it feels like it's going. It's gonna. If I do this sometimes, it actually stops it. But I got to be careful because if I hit myself in the eye, this podcast is over. And I did that once. I cut my eye. You were podcasting with somebody. Things were going okay. You yep. poked yourself in the eye and you went, "All right, I'm yep. out of here." For the sake of the story, <laughs> we'll say yes to that. But everything about the beginning of that was completely different. We could. Um, Fix the twitch if you're I'm worried good. about what it looks. I'm actually post. good. You know what'll help that is once I have a little tea and I'm not I'm not trying to hurry you. I'm not doing the giddy up game, but I would love that. Yeah, I don't feel hurried. Listen, I'm not. I can't change how long. This is making me think of uh, my cousin Vinny when the guy makes his grits and he goes, "No self-respect in Southerner uses instant grits." And he's like, <laughs> "Well, now I know how long it took." I probably watched that movie seriously. No uh, comedic embellishing. 150 times because I worked at a video store called Video Horizons. Shout out to Video Horizons. We'll put uh, no longer here. Defunct. But when it was there and it was in its heyday, I was the manager and I would keep that uh, that and Uncle Buck were pretty much uh, on a constant rotation. In some River Phoenix movie where he sang country western music at the Bluebird Cafe in Nashville with Sandra Bullock. I don't know the movie, but I do. But that know was the third one on the on the because I had a little crush on Sandy. I do I know some her, country I music. Could I tell you a couple of them? Yeah. Can I know? Yeah. All right. Well, there's obviously... Baby, lock them doors and turn the lights down low. I do you know that one? That just, you just made me feel good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, the other one, I don't know if it's technically country, but my favorite song, I even bought a banjo to play this on the banjo because I saw them, Dwight, or uh, what's his name? Ed Helms' Dwight character Yoakum? in The Office. Uh, Ed Helms? Uh, yeah, once he was on there, I was... Well, he plays um, country road. This would sound really good in here. Take me home. Because he picks up the bass. Right. To the place that I belong. Oh, terrible harmony. Yeah, not I good. couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, you were already off. And then how can I get on? The how two, can I harmonize off pitch? The two of us together was not built for that song. Yeah. Maybe you could fix that with the uh, clacks and dings. <laughs> that I belong. Oh, terrible harmony. Yeah. Oh, we're back. You did something that a lot of people don't do that's a good thing, which is when you're coming in to sing with somebody else, mm -hmm. you didn't rush the downbeat. You know what I just realized really quickly? I haven't taken in the room. We got into this so yeah. fast that now it's like I'm trying to focus on you, but I want to look at shit. I understand Because I've only been here. I've never, you've never had me. Correct. Um, and I understand, you know, you got There's a certain kind of protocol, I guess, to where you want visitors. But I just wanted to look around a little bit because you've had a career that's obviously... All right, I've seen it all. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> no, I, I really needed a second because I was, I was focused on you, but you know, you need a moment to settle into your surroundings. I still am waiting on T, which you There's put a, a timer, yeah. A passcode in, right? Yes. Well, For T. Sure. I heard at least I'm a bit of a sleuth and I'm kind of a rubberneck and I was eavesdropping. Like these type of words. And I heard 11, I heard at least uh, like 11 beeps. Because I kept turning on the microwave for 10 minutes. Oh. And I meant to do the timer for 10 minutes. Okay. Does that make sense? Is that, um, uh, okay. I mean, that's you had to dive joke in. number two you couldn't find. <laughs> it's missing. I mean, I'm shocked at all that, how much work it takes. I can't believe that you think that I'm leaving these with you when I'm absolutely not. Could I have one of them? No. Maybe. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Dane, you're looking around... And we have, I, a, we have a similar thing, you and I, where we, certain anxieties and uh, distractions, I feel like we share in them. Okay. And you're looking around. Are you, like, the light, is, is it hard to get, like, to get present sometimes when you're not there yet? Does that make sense? I just like, I, I, I like to know where my exits are, first of all. Like Jason when Bourne. I, yeah, I mean, to some extent, sure, like Jason Bourne. I, just, I can tell you the license plate numbers of all six cars outside. I can tell you that our waitress is left-handed and the guy sitting up at the counter weighs 215 pounds and knows how to handle himself. I know the best place to look for a gun is the cab of the gray truck outside. And at this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Uh, I just, yes, in case of emergency, I like to know. I would hate to think if, God forbid, something happened, which it seems like a pretty relaxed atmosphere but like what if i thought this was an exit and behind it was uh you know like a matrix brick wall so i just like what's the, a matrix brick wall as opposed to just a brick wall the matrix movie when they tried to exit oh a brick wall that shouldn't yeah, have been there like in the matrix called and there was a wall and that was not an exit so i think i just like to know my i don't know what's around the corner i've yet to see the rest of your place so i'm i'm a little do you want to see the place before so you feel more safe sure uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> First rule of improv, Rick. <laughs> Never fight. What is it again? Only, you're only allowed to fight or something? I don't know. Do you want to go hit some more buttons in your kitchen and make me more nervous? <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I could probably get you the tea. It hasn't been seeping a full 10 minutes. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Yeah, and that'll give me a second to dab off because I don't know if it's a, it's a, it's a hot box in here. Tinder box. I'll put the fan back on, yeah. but in the corner. Okay, great. Okay, cool. What do you call it? Bars and... Clanks and dings? Clanks and dings. Ah. Uh, what is this? Why this now? Because you want to put your spoon on it. Oh, I thought you had a thing about that on the glass because I no. saw an episode once where somebody put that on the glass and you got very uh, uncomfortable. And put that also while we're on this conversation, let's not have that as close to the edge. This? Yeah. Okay, great. I'll put it right in the middle for you. Will that make you feel safest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about the, the rings on it. Yeah. I just don't want the, them on the edge. Okay, this is, there's a lot of stuff happening here. So let me... So look at, look at, take yeah. the, take the... This is why, you know, I'm going to give you a gift. First, first I'm going to give you the gift of knowledge, and then I'm going to give you an actual gift. The gift of knowledge is there's something called a steeper. You can buy one of these things, and the tea bag goes inside, and it's sealed so that you never have to have two items. You could have the steeper with the tea bag inside of it. Like, for example, I have one that looks like a, a, a medieval axe. Yes. 
Okay. I, I know the steeper. One. I have that actually. Okay. Well, maybe buy, get another one for guests. <laughs> and then what you do is you have the steeper and then, well, this is fine. I don't want that now. <laughs> it's hot. It's just too hot. Here. Whatever, whatever this is, ha whatever's happening in here with us right now, this is where we need to be. You know what? Right? I, you're being playful, but I think that's very poetic and true. Shins and splints. Cut to a clip of Schindler's that. List. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it as the editor. <laughs> um, I'll tell uh, you something that I think will help you out. Okay. I really do. All right. And I don't push this on too many is people. This is the shot. That's going to be in the shot the whole time. Mm. Okay. I don't know. Is it in the shot? I don't know. If you put the headphones on, you'll be here with me a little right. bit better. I'm in the room. I'm here. I'm comfortable. I feel great. I like this whole idea of the shoes off. I went with gold toe for you today, by the way. S sounds like a first draft of a, of a oh, fuck. What's his name? James Bond movie. Shit, I hate missing jokes. <laughs> I hate missing jokes. I also almost said Austin Powers, and it still could have worked. <laughs> this is gold toe. And it's like, all right. Goldto, remember the video game for Nintendo? Goldto? It was a spinoff of Golden Eye, which is the joke you were looking for a minute ago. I found it. Okay. Relax. Ladies and gentlemen, Dane Cook. We'll be right back. Whew, man, there's some huge shit. Whoa, what's this? Wow. This is really cute. Should I try it on? I'll try it. Her size. So cute. I think that this fits. It's a small, because I'm kidding. I'm Kevin Bacon's daughter, and I take huge shits. Okay, great. We're back. You have to snap. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Your hands are full. No. Okay. Chica. So, uh, Let's get into could, it. Could have used a little bit more on the pot. It's more of a lukewarm tea. But it's so hot today, I think it evens it out. I'm okay. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, I was thinking of what could be a dark question to ask you that doesn't cross a line, but makes sense for it to be like a quick transition. Be like you've had a lot of death in your life kind of thing. I'm far enough away from it. I, I can handle those kinds of things. I'm just pitching you the idea instead of doing it. Sold. Actually, that brings me a good question Sold. I have for you. Yeah. When I was first starting out, I... Uh, in life or in comedy? Comedy. Okay. What's the difference? Well, I don't know. I, I just think it's an interesting way to look at this life is when you were first starting out. Yeah, I would have said like when you, I was born. Yeah. That's that, you adding syllables again. That's, that's one version of it. That's, that's probably the perspective of the people bringing you into this world as opposed to maybe you brought yourself into this world. Sure. At the beginning of the game, but of comedy... Yeah. Uh, before I would try a joke on stage, I would be worried it doesn't work. So I would try it out in front of friends Oof. and I would ask. And I learned, Oof. yeah, I, I learned, you know, that so much that you should never, because best case scenario, they go, yeah, good. Right. That's best case. Yeah. So I learned never to do that okay. really quick. But then it's like, uh, sometimes I'll have a joke idea that I want to run with somebody. Right. But like, I feel like, I'm not going to run it with somebody until I try it on stage first. Okay. Do you connect to that at all? None of it. You have a lot of death in the family. <laughs> you can't say it laughing. You got to really hit that like. Say none of it again? <clears throat> uh, I mean, none of it. None of what you said I relate to, no. Who's left in your family that's still around? I don't like that. That didn't feel, the first one felt funny. I didn't like that. I was, I'm sorry. I was going with yeah, it too. Yeah, I didn't like that. I, I actually feel really <clears throat> gross. You, the, I'll tell you what I did think, even though we'll never use it. I thought I am an orphan and it fucked me up because both my parents have died. I'm an orphan. You I, brought me to that place today. I don't think an orphan is not having parents. I think orphan is not having parents. Maybe it is. Am I the guest on this? Why am I being chastised? I thought I was supposed to feel welcomed. Anyway, go ahead. Do you want to blow your nose? Do you want to sip that quieter? <laughs> is this a noise contest? Is that what we're in? Because I can do that. Off my laugh. Do, uh, uh, so Because I could do that off my laugh. Dane, yep. I want you to do something for me for animation. Yep. I want you to go like this, and we're going to have fireworks come out of your pants. And I want to say, what's the line? Are you fucking from retaliation? 
it's a, one day you said one day I want to have fireworks come out of my and said, are you are you fucking insane? Have you lost your fucking mind? Was that are what you, it was? Are, yeah, something like that. Are you out of your fucking mind? Are you out of your fucking mind? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I'll, uh, we're gonna cut back to Dane. Dane's gonna finish sipping, and then fireworks are gonna come out. But are, I'm gonna are we sure that's legs. what it is? Because I'm gonna play that clip. I could. Yeah. Are you sure that's what it is? Sure. Are you out of your fucking mind? Are you out of your fucking mind? I could yeah. find it very quick. Yeah, I don't listen to my own material on the daily, but are you out of your fucking mind? All right, okay, ready? Uh, whatever. You, yeah, go ahead. Oh wait, Dane, I'm sorry. When you do it. Give it time. So we like five seconds. You could. Yeah. Okay. You know, got it. And I can stay like this, but still. Re- okay. Yeah. But Ready? do some physicality. Yeah. I'll give it a little physical uh, <laughs> absurdities. What, what are you am I, do- am I doing? It? Yeah. Oh, you're. Oh, wow. You're okay. I'll give it another. I mean, you weren't really giving me much, Dane. But- I was waiting on you to, to well, I was, signal me. I was. Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> Are you out of your fucking mind? I'm just going to leave in the whole okay, the just, whole thing there. Just use me having that seizure without any uh, effects, and I think that'll even be as interesting. So people know what I'm referencing. Uh, I'm going to play that clip of your stand-up okay. over us. So yes. we could act like what they do in, uh, you know, in the news once the music kicks in. They can't hear us. You know, so we're just. This is a direct quote that I want to receive someday from someone. Are you out of your fucking mind? So just to sum up real quick, I love words. I use a lot of, uh, uh, you know, great Scrabble, 10 10 point words. And then we were talking about the beginning of your life, which we never quite finished that. Yeah, I want to get into, uh, since we've met. Can I also, can I just put the, uh, can I put two thoughts together as well? It doesn't sound like it. (laughs) <laughs> I would have thought so. Yes, I, I, I tried years ago to share an antidote with a friend. Anecdote or an antidote? Antidote. Antidote Ant- is like an elixir. Antidote. I tried to share an antidote with a friend, an elixir, <laughs> and they unfortunately still succumbed to the poison that was coursing through their their veins. Now I also have an antidote. An- oh, wait. <laughs> now which one is it? Are we keeping this all in? Because no, I'm no, having no. a good time, but no, this no, is no. a fucking train wreck. I don't care. Um, I don't want to be a train wreck. Let's get let's fuck the, that train. Let's get in a bus. Let's go somewhere else. D- that doesn't matter. Not a train wreck in a bad way. It's just we're we're both very hyperactive people, kind of cl- clicking into that. I was trying to answer because I, I, there's a few different avenues in my my mind, and the one that uh, I keep seeing the street sign blinking is. I don't, I don't, I couldn't share material with people that I knew because it was never funny to them. It was always like questions of why do I think that's funny? And so I, I've never shared my yeah. stuff with people. I can't. And so I'll take it on stage. If somebody has a feeling about it after, great. But I don't trust other people. I barely trust my own idea. I have to see if it's going to work up there. But I don't know how you could run things by anybody. Hey, can I? Can I? Th- well, this was literally like before I even moved out to LA. Like yeah. the first year, right? I didn't realize how much I was making myself spin because I would go on stage and it's like it already bombed once in front right. of Alan, you know. Um, but also, you're a performer. Uh, I mean that quite literally. Not you know, we're all are, but you, your jokes. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, I think this is a tribute to your success, but. Your jokes, relatively speaking, won't work on paper. Okay. Compared to other people. Does that make sense? Is that an insult? Because I feel that way about me. I mean, <clears throat> I don't I don't know if my earlier material would have hopped off the page because a lot of it was so tied to something physical. Right. But I think after Vicious Circle or even e- I wanted Vicious Circle to be like, can you close your eyes and enjoy listening to it as much as seeing the antics or the behaviors? And so that's when my comedy started to grow into a new new direction, fusing together physical and the written. Voice. I want to talk about this part of, of your career okay. and life for, for, for the moment, right? As a performer that relies heavily on physicality and energy, is that, is, is, did you find that taxing? No, sustainable. No, never. In fact, it's the it's it was there at the very beginning. You know, some comics you see them at the beginning of their career, and they're trying to figure it out. And then as time goes on, you see like they're trying to add some physical, or they're trying to. I'm going to sit on the stool now, or I'm going to. 
I was, I loved movement right out of the gate. I was influenced by Steve Martin. I was influenced by uh, Martin Short. I liked energy. I liked John Ritter when he was on Three's Company. So I enjoyed when there was, and then as I started getting into stand-up, I'd watch Chris Rock. And I liked the way he would move around the stage. And so I, I appreciated somebody who leaned into using all their faculties to create a story. What happens when you're doing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, and it's 7 p.m. and your first show's about to start and you just fucking don't have it? It's there. It's there when you get up there. I've never had the problem of, I don't feel like I want to do this tonight, or I'm tired, or I had a stressful day. You never day feel or, that way, or it doesn't get in the way of no, you? No, I've always had... You've never felt too tired before a set? I, I have felt tired. In fact, two weeks ago, I had an exhausting day. I was up super early, and my girlfriend and I were talking. We were like, I, I worked out today. I ran all those errands. I did two Zoom calls, uh, and then I had a show. And she was like, how are you going to do it? And I knew I was exhausted. I said, when you're walking toward that stage, that adrenaline, I guarantee I could be coming from a nap. I know how I'm going to feel when I get on stage. So it's a drug. I wouldn't say it's a drug. It's, it's, it's you, the, chemically, you know that it, even if I'm tired, walking up to stage does something to you. Right, right. No, I know that. And, and the, the, the pressure that comes with not wanting to fail uh, the audience. Not just, there's new people that are gonna see me and have an opinion, because they've heard about me, and they wanna see what's he got. And then what about the fan that wrote me on DM and said, we're driving eight hours to come to the Laugh Factory to see you tonight. All that stuff kind of permeates, and when you hit the stage, you can't not wanna give everything you've got. All right. Uh, you could take a second to to listen to this okay. because you're on camera and we want to represent ourselves well, right. right? There is a selfishness and a selflessness okay. to what we do, what anybody does, right? A lot of people I talk to talk to me about the selflessness of like, I just, you know, you never know who ha somebody had a bad day in the audience or you want to make pe nobody, you know what? People leave, need laughs more now than ever and all that stuff, right? I don't believe, and maybe I'm projecting this, but I really don't believe that we're not originally, at least, and still probably driven by wanting to feel special, feel loved, validated, right? Does that, do you agree to that? Maybe that's, maybe that is very much of you, but I don't know if that's the equation that courses through me before I hit the stage. I don't, I don't mean before you hit the stage. There's, right. there's no timeline to this. I'm right. saying what got you into this. What got me into and it the is, reason, okay. And the reason you're gonna get so this, is it really because I want these people to have a good time, which I, I, I concede exists very, very much. Right. But I wanna talk about this part of like, I wanna be great, I wanna be the best. I know you wanna be the best. We've talked about your need to, things need to be the best. For me? Yes. Yeah. So I need to feel like I got 100% of the 100% I put in, right? You said that people who are fans of yours, you give them what they're expected, and people who don't know you, you're giving them a great time and you're showing them something. Right. If that doesn't happen, what does that mean about you, in, the kid in you? What does that mean about the kid in you in that moment that makes you feel bad? Wow, okay. Uh, <clears throat> It's, it is not very often that I leave the stage worried about the kid in me that I didn't come through for who, that young version of myself because after years of conditioning and, and, and failing and then obviously accomplishing to, to validate myself, I know I know when I I know what it feels like to not care or not give something in life. I don't do that on stage. I always have. Give me an example of when you do that or when you've done that. I, I you know I don't know. You get invited to a dinner party. You don't want to go that night, and you kind of like show up because it's like right. it's an obligation, and you just go with the motions. You just go with the flow. So you're and, saying you're not showing up authentically. I, I, I'm just saying I, I I don't know the best example, but I do understand in my body that feeling of like I don't. I'm not uh, having to prove something to myself here in this moment. I'm not having to... I don't think that you could have gotten the success that you got and 
if it wasn't for something driving you internally, right. not making these people happy. He, right. That's never, it's, it's never been contingent on are they happy. It's contingent on have I brought a group of people into my fantastical way of thinking and are they on the ride with me? Or if they're not, are they still watching going, this wild son of a bitch what do you mean? Are they on the right of you? Like they get to share your life's perspective? I, I I feel like I stumbled early into some idea or philosophy or somebody, maybe my my mentor Frank Roberts, somebody imparted in me the desperation of feeling like you need to hit a certain marker that they might be thinking you need to hit. That's not how you do it. Could you explain that differently? Uh, it, it just means like you're not. You're, if you feel like you have delivered for yourself, if you've dug down deep and you feel like you've given a performance or I'm sure athleticism or whatever we put into that, that box of like, okay, this is my moment to my medal to really pull out of me something that I think is exceptional in me. Even if it doesn't connect with them in that way, you still leave knowing. I connect, that, I connect with that. Yeah. That, you know that electricity that you have and if you hit it or not. Right. And so... I can't think of too many moments, honestly, in my in my career of stand up. Now, we're talk, movies and other things that are on sets and a lot of moving parts and other people's puzzle that you're a part of. That we're not talking about that. Strictly stand up for thirty years, from early hell gigs where they didn't care that I was coming. Early and didn't what gigs? Hell gigs. Hell gigs. At, you know, like uh, bad bar, yeah. bad restaurant, fucking. Attic of a pizza shop gigs. AOAPS. Where I would say back then, nobody gives a shit that I'm coming there and nobody will give a fuck when I leave. Those gigs. Yeah. I still left there with my heart racing knowing I left it in the room. Did you feel uh, then, you know, this is, uh, what's the shop that, that, uh, that I heard when I moved out here that you kind of, it was you and Jay Davis, I think. Okay. Where, Dublin's? What? Yes. Dublin's right. that, that was on West in West Hollywood, right? Yeah, Dublin's was a uh, Irish pub. When I hear stories of, of when people moved here, when you were doing that kind of stuff, right? It, it was uh, they the, nobody they, nobody killed like Dane Cook. That was you know that was your spot that you popularized. Mm -hmm. So people were coming to see you there, right? Was was uh, was it then or was it before that you felt like before before because I already was I was already on to this idea of. If, if I, I want to explain this the right way. I'm in the formula of my routine and I know the routine is solid. What is it in the formula? I, I'm, I, I know the pieces of material that are going to do well tonight. And yet if I, if I don't take the stage, Dublin's really solidify this. If I take the stage and say, fuck the formula, but I know when I dig into a piece of material, I'm going to, it's going to work for me. Then what they're watching is eight comics in a row that did a set list. And then I come up and simply by the idea of me saying, Justin Timberlake, what's up, man? You're in the room or like in breaking up the monotony of just uh, the act. Now you've got something that's non-formulaic. This is real. This is happening. That's exciting. And then when I lean into a piece of material and that's getting a laugh, that's what I think elevates you in a moment like that to feel like, wow, you're, he's doing something so incredibly different because I... I didn't only do the routine. Could I give an example now and tell me if this is right of doing something that is both present and acknowledging the room while also having the material and the work that you put in? Sure. A gift. A gift. Hindsight and all the things I can't see in front of me. This is... <laughs> Nobody's ever going to, because I just brought up Justin Timberlake. Is this what you're talking about? Sitting in the room. So I've given that gift to probably wow. 20 people now. Wow. I bought a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And that's my last one, although I'll probably buy some more. Wow. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I appreciate this. Thank you for the gold records. That's kind of a trade. So I, you didn't know which camera to look into. I, <laughs> I just know that those have to come with me when I leave. So... Oh, you know what? Because I, I'm gonna fill up my coffee. Now you're trying to sell this. Do you want me to like hold this up for somebody? No, that's a gift. Oh, it is. I a don't gift. want to negate your joke, but that's a gift. You're not negating. <laughs> 
there's a, uh, I know exactly where we are. We're getting back to it, but I want to say there's a balance that's, that I think is, for me, one of the most challenging parts of the craft. Okay. Not just of stand up, but of comedy. Right. Which is balancing that silly playfulness, which to me is the ultimate way to connect. Like when you came in, I don't know how I'm chopping up the beginning of this episode, by the way. Okay. I do know that if it's not on a podcast, it's that's, that's what wakes me up. Yeah. And then transitioning into this, but while still keeping balls in the air. Right. And what I have found from podcasting, which is very different than stand-up, is it's very much reliant on the other person being willing to take the same turns with you and you being able to take them with them. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and then when you have somebody like you who is always wanting to one-up and play, <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean like, it's like a kid. It's, uh, it's parry thrusting, and I enjoy that. That's a fencing term. Oh, I thought you were talking about my editor fucking. Shout out to Perry. We'll put his Instagram handle up here. <laughs> That's not what I was saying. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the Dublins before Dublins. You knew that you have your material. Yes. We've talked about this before, how Howard Stern has his questions put aside, and maybe he'll get to them. But Right. He's got his he's little there. cheat sheet of things, but he'd rather be in the moment, in the flow. But you're... you're oh, Cheat sheet for us. Okay. Um, if, I, if I were to go back from Dublin's to performing with a young Dave Chappelle, 1993, I'm in New York City. Shout out to Dave Chappelle, prison's a crying love here. Dave Chappelle, of course. Um, 1993? Was, 93, yeah, 93, Where 94. Is this, New York or New York DC? City, yeah. And we were, we were doing some college gigs together. And there was always a bunch of us that were like doing these like SUNY schools and up and down through New York City and New England. And, and Dave had been, if you know anything about Dave, he was learning from uh, Charlie, who was teaching him comedy in the park. And there was this whole like, you know, uh, incredible Charlie kind of, Murphy? No, no, Charlie uh, Chaplin. Barnett. Charlie Chaplin was teaching Dave Chappelle stand-up comedy. Cut yeah. to a clip. <laughs> Here's where if I knew Chappelle, I'd be like, just put the mustache on. I need 10, five seconds. <laughs> but who are you saying, Charlie who? Because I don't know I, who this I, is. You know what? It, uh, Charlie Barnett. I don't know who Charlie Barnett is. Don't use any of this. It's, it's Honestly, it's too much of a rabbit hole no, to get into. No, it's fine. But continue. It, let me bring it right back to the service. I'm not editing this out. Doing gigs early with Dave Chappelle and some of the performers that were in and around New York at the time, I think that... There was a understanding that we were the next group of stand-up comics coming up, and we were looking for ways to break the 1980s formulaic comedy, which felt a little bit more, little bit more rigid. Uh -huh. By and rigid, you mean bit, bit, bit for television? Bit. Yeah, yeah. Everything yeah. was like you know, set a punch, set a punch, set a punch. And I was seeing some storytellers and somebody like Dave. I we were already learning from each other wh whether we were understanding that or not that we would do gigs and then kind of break things down after the show at the table and try to figure out like, how can I be more myself and find my audience based on the material I love, but letting them know the person who also came up with that material. That was always missing from stand-up. What do you mean? Stand-up used to be, except for the person on panel, when you saw them after they do their jokes on a late night show, then what would they do, Rick? They'd sit and they'd do more jokes, right? It was kind of like, hey, this is where yeah, yeah, I yeah. banter with uh, Johnny but it's, it's a few more bits that we set up. I think I and we understood there was more to stand up than just the onstage performer. And if you could fuse the, 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 the real opinionated person and funny off the cuff or whatever that might be coupled with the formulaic onstage persona, that might be a more interesting place to live. Who was your, who was your group? Like Chappelle, Patrice O'Neill, maybe? Chappelle was New York. Before, it was Patrice O'Neill, Bill Burr, Gary Goleman. Gary Goleman is so funny, man. I mean, all everybody in that group from there that then hopped to New York City, we were just workers. We were, we were doing it not, not just because... But who, else, who, 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 who broke through from, the, from, that, from your group? Well, I, I was the first one to go to New York, and then to be in L.A., and I think I was the first one to get on television with a show I did with Betty White. Do you attribute that to going to L.A.? If other people went to L.A. sooner, that could have happened? Um, I think that based on my gigs at colleges and understanding the, the rapport that I had with my, kind of my age, you know, my, my you know, 
people that I would walk down a, uh, a hallway in a college to do a show and a teacher might say, um, hey, the show's over there. And I'd be like, I am the show. Like I was hanging out with my, my Ju- group. Bad judge, dread impression. Does that, is that what he said? That drug trans- he goes, I am the law. Okay, so it's... <laughs> We'll put it in the clip. Sorry for the momentum cut, but this is the game, man. <laughs> this is why it's so raw. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. I feel like I kind of rode the, the line there between commercial and casual, Betty. I think you did good. I think it was nice. Thank you. Rick, you know I have a little bit of an issue with hair pulling. Yes, your compulsion of hair pulling. I do. OCD. Yeah, it's my little OCD thing that I am now in the process of getting some help with from a therapist. I know. I'm happy about that. Yeah, and I'm really excited to see what happens. BetterHelp is great because not only are you going to be getting better help, it's also an easier kind of barrier to entry. It could be daunting to find the right therapist. And therapy isn't just for people that are at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, if you are a little depressed or you have some compulsions or you're trying to quit something you're addicted to or just need somebody to talk to, BetterHelp's a great option. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And it's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and take your shoes off listeners. Get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Taiso. Betty, you're such a better help to me. Yeah, I am. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Taiso for 10% off your first month. Betty, they're not going to see you, but will you snap with me? Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Raycon. Listen, if I know one thing, I know... Mm that I should learn more things. Yeah. And then I was able to. And while going out into the world, I discovered things that not only smell good, not only they taste good, but sound good. Mm-hmm. We're talking Raycons, wireless earbuds. You know, when I'm trying to pump it up or pump it down or mm. even just pump it up a little bit or- Or take, pump it down a little bit. Or pump it down a little bit. If I'm trying to pump it up or pump it out or pump it in or pump it there or pump it left or, you know what? If you're gonna pump it- What are you getting at? Because this is getting long. If you're gonna listen to the sounds of today with the feelings of tomorrow, Raycon earbuds will get you to where you need to go. You know, Adam, actually, huh? you haven't checked out the everyday earbuds that right. Raycon Easy. is doing. It's actually great. It looks good, feels good, and sounds good. And think about that on your walk. You know what, Brent? Brent? Yeah. Brent, Adam, Adam, Adam. They got three new sound profiles. <laughs> Do it again. Adam Adam Adam, 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 Adam. I just wanted to get to it. It's not a Rottweiler chasing a child. I don't get it, and I hate Adam, it. Adam, 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 don't! <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, but Adam, act out. But is Adam the... The, the child dog. or the dog? The dog. dog. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you well, and that's because I'm not using Raycon wireless earbuds. I mm-hmm. want to tell you, you get the perfect amount of bass. They got pure mode, which is for podcast listening, balanced mode, which is for mm-hmm. podcast listening, and bass mode, which is for fucking. <laughs> <laughs> right now, Tyso listeners get 15% off the Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash Tyso. That's buyraycon.com slash Tyso for 15% off your first order of headphones. That's buyraycon.com slash Tyso. Do it with me. That's buyraycon.com slash Tyso. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Here we go. Here we go. One, two, two three. three. That's That's buyraycon.com buy slash Tyso. The point is, all those early years, I was surrounded by comics that we're trying to break out of just simply formulaic. Patrice O'Neill is the perfect example of somebody who would go up on stage, he knew he could do funny stuff, but he chose to sometimes sit in a thought. That's where my tell me this was going from. What is your mentality? Because uh, we talked about on the phone the other day, because mm-hmm. you we had a couple of these scheduled, we had a reschedule. Right. Due to rain at one point. Right. And you <laughs> walked out and it was raining, and I literally, it was my first time doing an indoor one. So right. I hadn't figured out the setup yet. So all morning, I'm bringing stuff from outside. I'm setting up, right, right. and it was raining, and you canceled last minute. Right, and I told you why. Yeah, because it made you anxious. D- why would, did it make me anxious? Your shoes, your hair, bringing stuff. No, because I, don't know. I told you, we experienced incredibly traumatic moments growing up with flooding in my home, and I get, I get very unsettled with monsoon level rain it wasn't just a light sprinkle that day it was a real heavy rain that came through it was a heavy rain and i called you up and i think that you thought that i was giving you a a, a line no but, i, I believe truly you. i wanted to be able to come in here and 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 uh be present with you and i didn't want to be worrying that my house was flooding even though by the way i live on a hill it's impossible that my house could flood i know but i still think there's a way it could and so i appreciate that we waited I bring that up because a couple of things, full transparency, and I think I even told you this on the phone, right. was happening. Hey, man, 
I just rearranged my apartment. Yes. And a half hour before you're supposed to be here, you cancel. Right. And you said to me, you know, if you really want me to come, if you're going to be upset. And I said, listen, if you can't, you can't. But yeah, I want, I mean. Right. But then I still recognize then and even more so after some other conversations we had about some stuff mm -hmm. that I really could appreciate, at, which is, you know, maybe you don't like this about yourself. Maybe it's you, you're trying to fix it. Maybe you can't. But you know. I'm not going to shine in this environment. For whatever reason, however silly it may seem to other people, you know that about you. So you're able to say, I can't do this. Right. I very much could connect to that. And when I realized that, it right. didn't make it go from, which I said to you, I said, come on, man, that's ridiculous. To like, you know, I have my things. Right. And what the character trait that that relates to in me outside of when to podcast or not is... Sometimes something happens externally right. where you just, like what I was anticipating maybe was happening when you were looking around the room. Right. Listen, I, I'm, I, I can't thrive here. Uh -huh. That happens uh, in life. We could maybe get into that. But you know what I'm talking about, right? I, I'm trying to follow you because we went from talking about early New York and now I think It's that all connected. I think, I, okay. It's all connected. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm with you. What I'm getting at is, Dane Cook, you know, very accomplished, okay, <laughs> figured out how to do stand-up. And, it, you know, there's... there's uh, <laughs> He's afraid of rain. There, it, no, no, no. What I'm getting at is you know how to do this thing, right? Sure. But there are still obstacles that you might have that other people have never... Aren't even an obstacle if it happens to them. Okay. You're distracted. You get distracted. I'm trying to connect with you, and, and I'm sorry if, if I'm really leaning into this, but... I, I like it. You should lean into this. This is interesting stuff. I will also relate to this where I get very distracted. Something will happen. Um, I don't know, for example, I keep checking if the red light is still going on this camera, right? Because sometimes they turn off. Right. If I don't check that light, I'm not here with you. Okay. The moment I realize, so I know I'm right. going to have to keep checking it. And on the next podcast, we'll talk about that a lot more. What do you mean? The light situation. Absolutely. Okay. Something has to happen. <laughs> For me to be able to be present. I get it. And if I'm not present, I, I'm, I, so my question to you is, for someone who is like that with some things, yeah. what happens when you're on stage? Because when I'm on stage and that happens, it's, I don't know how to, because you can't control everything. You can't control right. the rain. You and can't that, control. Right. Well, okay, now we're talking about two completely different things because, boy, this is, this is tricky because I, it's an entirely different I am conditioned for 30 years very differently of how I approach the stage and what I know I need before I take the stage and what I need to be doing on stage versus if a, if a monsoon level rain comes in. Well, let me acknowledge this. Let me take it for one second, just yeah. in case this came across poorly. It doesn't I, come across poorly. It's just hard to fuse these two. Okay, then I'm not doing approaches. my job right. First, <laughs> let me acknowledge this. The rain thing... <laughs> I mean this in a very honest, healthy, good way. Yes. I hope you don't feel I was calling you out for anything. I did feel like you were calling me out. Well, then, then let only because I wasn't ready for that segue. Because we were talking about, I was actually, I was vicariously enjoying talking about early years, and then it it kind of whip snapped to mm -hmm. why did you fuck me and not show up for my that, that's, last that, podcast? That's, that's not it, it, that's it not it what I meant. And I didn't mean that to be hostile back. I'm saying that's what it felt like in that moment where you suddenly. Like I noticed that energy shift. That's on me. Right. I didn't bring it up for that. Okay. I, I didn't think I would even bring bring it up. I don't remember what got us there, but something made me think of... I'm, st I'm still the foundation for me of where you are. The foundation is formulaic and being present on stage. And somehow that went back to 93. It went to Dublin's to 93, and then we've whipped all the way around to a very rainy day, and I canceled last minute on you. Are you still upset about that? Zero percent. Okay. It makes clangs me, and chimes. It makes me feel closer to you. <laughs> I mean, that's I, I'm bringing this up not in a calling you out way. I, I know you're not calling me out. It, let, let's really. Here's how I know. First of all, I love you. I respect you, and we have an amazing friendship for a lot of years. I know that you know. I could have just said nothing that day. I could have said something's come up. I can't. I can't do it. A, a family issue or some bullshit. 
but I actually said, can I talk to you for a little bit? And I walked you through some trauma that I had in my life and why something that seems superfluous, like it's really raining heavy to you've been setting up and to the, then to me apologizing several times to be like, dude, I really feel bad. Then a follow-up text to be like, I truly feel dude, bad. That's what I was saying. When you told me that, at first, I, and we, we were very honest with each other. Right. And I told you, this is, yeah, that fucking too sucks. Honest with each other. No, it's great because it made me feel closer to you. <laughs> You're right. As it went on, it's like, <laughs> it, it, a very small example is sometimes people will ask me about coming on the podcast. Right. And I don't want to have them on the podcast. Ooh. A, and it's an uncomfortable position, but I tell them, I tell them that. How many people after you had Mark Marin on suddenly were like, hey, if you ever want me to swing by and hang with you? Like, oh, is that the turning point? Do you think? No. I think that a lot of people after that was were like, oh, shit. Maybe. I, I, I guess I didn't clock it. I feel, I feel like as a fan and on the exterior when I was just watching, and I've been watching your podcast for some time, I felt like I remember saying that day, I guarantee legitimacy is in other people's Why? minds. Why? Because like, having him? Yeah, because you had a fucking unbelievable... Right. And not only that, but it was great. It was it was all the things that I hope we, you know, chip off in this, which is like it was compelling, it was funny, it was silly, it was um, the sniffing. Do you do? Should we take a break? Because you know what, I'm starting to get a little. It might be when I get when I'm feeling like a connection with somebody. It happens a lot if I'm giving a compliment. Uh, okay. Uh, my my eyes water and or uh, it's, right. I don't know if I feel emotional. It's just there's something that happens. I, I know that thing too. I, that that happens to me too. But. The, the point is, we don't need to go down that road because we're not trying to make people... <laughs> we've got like so many... We've got so many doors that we've cracked place. open. Um, do you want to bring it back or should I? Let me take it. When you're doing b jokes and then also being present, yes. that's what I'm connecting to, this yes. thing about, well, the rain is not going to allow me to be present. Okay. Listen, man, shit happens. And I love that you told me the truth. People make excuses. I don't like it. I know what it is. And then it's easier to digest, right? Right. Uh, so also, it's easier to calibrate with that person because then next time it's raining, it's like I, I, I'll call right, you but, and say let's reschedule. But, and I, I hate to feel the need to point counterpoint. Yeah, forgive the almost pun. You're watering down what I was actually experiencing that day, which wasn't just the rain has caused me to. It was it was a deeper thing that it brought up in me, and unfortunately, it was because it happened last second, and I was ready to go out the door, and then suddenly I felt. Uh, I felt disconnected inside my own body. And I was like, I'm going to be not good for Rick today. I, I, I know that he wants to, I, we want to get a good flow going. And I don't want to be worrying about my house unnecessarily. So what happens when you're on stage? Okay. And not rain, something, anything. My dad died the day I went up at the Laugh Factory. I was with my dad the night before. I said, dad, I have a contractual obligation to go back and finish this film. I'm going to, I was doing Good Luck Chuck. And they gave me a couple days to go see my dad because he was not doing well. So I was appreciative to the production. I went home, had an amazing, beautiful 48 hours with my dad. Now I'm gonna, and, but he more than anybody loved business and he loved when you uh, um, kept your commitments. So I said, I gotta keep a commitment. I gotta go home. And then I'm going to come back after I shoot this one pickup or whatever they need me to do. You're saying from to East LA, Coast to I, West Coast. Boston to LA, and to then I go back to Boston. Sorry to see my dad. He died when I came back. I went immediately to the Laugh Factory an hour later, and I think I said to Jamie Masada, the owner of the Laugh Factory, my dad just died. So maybe within like a few hours of learning, my dad died. I, I entertained people. I was, I had the love of the game as I did weeks prior and weeks after. Regardless of what's happening in my life, when I take a stage, 300 people, 30,000 people, something just is there for me that I've already, in my professionalism, prepared to walk into, okay? Could you explain that you've prepared uh, just to walk into? Just years of conditioning, years of, years of knowing uh, the mechanics of stand-up comedy, for me. The musicality, the verbiage, the 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 embracing the movement and letting go of formulaic listen to the crowd make it a conversation if some glass breaks be in the moment all that stuff is kind of waiting for me there because i'm prepared for all of that because i've had every kind of scenario from pirates den gigs to carnegie hall 
you know, beautiful straight through. The point being, I went up that night, I had a set, I got laughs. Nothing impeded on that. And at the end, I said, my dad passed away today. And I think they laughed at first because they thought it was a bit. And then I acknowledged you, my you dad. You didn't acknowledge it at all in the set. I Near the end. Right. 12, 14 minutes just to Into feel, 20? Uh, of a 20-minute set. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And, uh, and then I acknowledged it. And then I said some beautiful words about my dad. And I was as real in that as I was in trying to find comedy in the comedic moments. Being present has always been the goal. When I landed on stage the first time at Catch Rising Star in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I had everything to learn, but one thing was already there. I love when I get on stage uh, movement. And I wasn't like... Because you're there. Because I'm here. Right. So yeah. the, the, the one thing that with the thread that I had at the very, 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 very start was, oh, wow, I'm, I'm a natural, I hate saying this, I'm a natural at movement. I'm a natural at, feel, at making an audience feel like I've done this before, even though it was early, those early gigs, I had everything to learn. So when I take the stage, yeah. the formula of the routine, I have two hours of material right now that I'm going to film for my special, October 29th Which, and 30th here's a great, in Boston. Here's a great time to uh, cut to uh, a promotion for your tour. Oh. Or for your special. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, wow, thank you. This is, that is too sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say quickly, please sit, for the people at home. I'm Dane Cook. You may know me from success. Uh, it's been 30 years of doing what I love, stand-up comedy. And this is really uh, an exciting moment to share. October 29th and 30th, I'm in Boston filming my next comedy special at the Wang Theater. If you're in Beantown, that's what we call it if you're a local, then come check me out and uh, be a part of something that's going to be very special. 30 years of stand-up comedy. I want to thank the crowd here and everybody at home. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, everybody. <laughs> hey, come on, Rick Glassman. Shut the fuck up. And we're back. Do you Is that okay to... that I did one, two snaps, or should it be the, at the same time? Uh, we'll okay, let that... I'll give you another one. Ready? And we're back. Now I'm concerned if you don't sniff, if you're not sniffling, I'm, not I'm like, connected. oh, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not tapping into his... <laughs> right, it's like telling like if we're having sex and I'm not hard enough. <laughs> I have found that, that I will be good enough on stage, at least good enough on stage, because I could be present, Right. I have discovered recently, well, yeah, in the past couple of years, how much I've relied on that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and how much I don't, how, how hard of a time I have if I'm not present. All of this stuff I'm talking about with the rain, which I don't mean to minimize. It's very, I, I get it. But I'm saying <laughs> right, right. anything that could take me out of him being present. Uh, if you're on a date with a girl uh, or a guy, and you're talking to them, and they kind of go like this for a second. Maybe they're not interested. Maybe they just looked away. But you you clock that something's going on. It's hard. It's it's hard. To, are you not? I guess maybe I projected that you're the same way as me with this. I, I locked onto something you said. Anything that takes me out of being present, and yet the whole goal is to be taken out of a moment to be present. That's what we're looking for on stage. What we're looking for, if we're talking about performance now, you're looking for something. That's why some of my best shows ever have been when there is a lot of uh, moving parts last minute. I, I don't, something happens. And, oh, and, you and, once told me that you try to, uh, you want to, you, uh, in a perfect situation, you want to walk in the door as they say your name. Yes. Because you don't want to even think about anything. Right, because that way I don't know what, has happened before, you're not hearing, did you hear, the, this, I, just let me discover it up there. Even if I say something and I go, oh, this guy with the hat, and he's already been talked to for 10 minutes. Somebody already talked to the guy in the hat for 10 minutes. It was hilarious. And so you go, oh, great hat. And everybody goes, ha ha, oh, that's Mike, the last comic, she tore it up. And then I go, well, I haven't been here. And I wanna get to know Mike maybe in a way that we don't know Mike. So Mike, forget about the funny hat. How's life, Mike? And then I'm taking it into a place where it's like, I, great. I, I guess I fucked up. I guess I'm, I, I guess I, I'm already revisiting territory that somebody else already mined Mike with his hat for all that great material. Now I'm present because I can't go with my initial thought of, I guess, I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I would have said about Mike, but he drew my attention to him. And then it's great to discover, oh, it's already been done. And then, th and then that's what brings you to something present. Now, if I can do some material 
and then somehow pull that in. You know, it's like, here's a punchline. There's a tag. And there's Mike with the hat. And Mike, you know what? We've already talked to you. No need to get back to Mike. We already know everything. The, but this is this is when they don't see the seams and then it's all this is without the obstacles that exist and for an analogy and literally i'm going to bring say this i have i mean a, a lot of times people will say about my podcast this is what they love about it i will also get rick gets in gets in the way of stuff because the same thing which is you get these things these distractions i can't get away from and i'm it's okay and we'll be fine okay. but i can't get away from the fact that i noticed since bringing up the the rain i'm 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 I feel like there was a, a, a shift. Okay. And now I'm like... I, I, it's almost like we're on a, one of those tandem bikes and we're just not quite pedaling together anymore. But we were. And that's right. okay to not be. Right. And it's actually beautiful to not be because that's gotcha. life. But the craft is, you know, pardon the metaphor or the cliche, but getting back on. And to do that, you have to acknowledge things. Right. Right. But, but I, I, I... Here's another pun. I'll spiral, <laughs> right? And when you're on stage, how do you know when to acknowledge it and when not to? Acknowledge you, what? That it's, that it's off the course? That it's yeah. off the tracks? Yeah. Yeah. You can acknowledge it. I've acknowledged it. I did Radio City Music Hall in 2019. The second I got out, I've been dreaming about this gig my whole life. The second I got out there, I took the mic, it broke. The, I haven't even said, good evening, Radio City Music Hall. It broke. And I went, oh, great gear, Radio fucking City Music Hall. Now I'm, I'm How shitting. How do they hear it? it, it um, you know the part that screws into the top? I wish I knew the jargon of the, all the different pieces of the, the mic. The mechanics of the mic would be interesting for this podcast. No, uh, I went to pull the microphone out. And they had, you ever do a gig and they, you don't know, it's uh, not a, it's not one of the ones that you put in. It's a, it's a clip. Yes. You, oh, that I don't like, but in that moment you're like, oh, okay. So I went put to, up an image. I went to do the clip, and then I I couldn't get it out of the clip. And then when I did that, the whole mic stand, right? Uh, you know, Steven Tyler. You ever see him, Aerosmith? And uh, put up a thing. He's got the mic, yes. and then it's he's just using like yes. the bass fell off, and he's just walking around with like this, uh, right? It's it's with like a handkerchief sword. on it. It's like yeah, it's like he's got that. It's got the hanka handkerchief, and then he's got the mic. Instantly. I knew it was going to be an amazing night. Not before I probably would have said, I'm at Radio City. I'm going to get into the material. And then once I'm riding the wave, it'll be a great night because I'm here and this is a beautiful venue. But now I knew it was going to be great because I like when something knocks me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the very beginning of my set. Or if I'm walking into Mike with the hat on. Oh, we already talked to Mike. Oh, fuck me. I guess I can't talk to Mike now. Right, because you, you, you thrive in acknowledging things. I thrive on the being on the on the i thrive on being the on the cusp of fear on stage knowing yeah, I i've got to the that. goods knowing I, I i've got the goods i've got my i've got my stuff right i may never even need to rely on it because now i'm so in the moment i did 40 minutes at the laugh factory the other night i didn't do one piece of material that i set out to practice for my special and it was 40 minutes off the cuff i think i spent like the first 15 just talking about depression in my teen years i didn't even know i was going to do it and i don't know what got me there but i i, I sat i steeped in it i reveled in it like oh this is i didn't know this was going to happen this way and when I you just enjoy when that. you do that how often does that become a bit that you then have sometimes yeah yeah sometimes you that's the best when you come off stage and you're like oh you know that that improv i didn't expect that but one piece of material i, I need to do that again I, that's probably the best thing that it's the best form of writing when it comes from the stage from a real conversation i uh also love that and but sometimes you can't repeat something because it's built into the situation of the room or the energy of the room and this bit works here because these external things happen i like to try and find ways to then manufacture those to happen again hmm. i find that to be quite difficult because then it's it's a lot bigger than just me right uh do you ever try and manufacture or find ways of controlling not just your set but the environment well, yeah. I mean, there's certainly there are there are moments that you know. There's like a a moment where you set up a piece of material where you're hoping one person yells out the thing that's going to, mm -hmm. and if they don't yell it, 
in your head, you're almost like, damn it. Why didn't somebody just yell uh-huh. out the girl? <laughs> or like, I have one piece of material where I talk about a YouTube video I saw where I'm talking about a ship and I go, people are getting thrown on the ship that was uh, at sea in a storm. And I say, people are getting thrown starboard. And then I pause and I go, and whatever the other fucking side of a boat is called. And one guy always yells, it's port. And then I go, I know it's port, you nautical fuck. I know it's port. I set up that joke that same way every night. And then I see where that takes me and it's a couple of minutes of like jabbering with somebody who thought they were on Jeopardy and were excited to know something that I didn't know. And then for the rest of the night, what I try to do, the challenge is I don't pre-plan other uh, ship vernacular, but I do try to find it as the night goes on just for my own joy and curiosity at what else do I know about boats or ships? And I see if I can pull those things in as well. There's a joke that you did in retaliation that was it was something about getting into your cerebellum. Right. Uh, Located near my limbic system. Yeah. And the way you delivered it, I felt like I had an inside scoop of how stand-up works because I just pictured you had to research that. You were even making fun of the term limbic system by the way you said it. Is that right? Yeah. I just remember being fascinated by the brain at that point in my life. And so I was reading a lot about the brain. <laughs> How much of how much of when you do stuff like uh, it, it's port or whatever these things are, how much of that is? Well, that's formulaic, right? That's part of the formula of that piece of material. And then let's sandbox it by hopefully pulling out some things that I didn't even know I was going to say. And then the crowd's laughing at, at uh, tags or buttons or whatever you're adding on is or callbacks. But maybe only that initial moment was formula part of the plan i mean that's what we we do have to have an act right it's like some things are procedural i would be very bored if i thought it had to be the exact same yeah i would i would not be doing this for a living yeah i'd be very bad at it if i had to d- deliver it like that because you wouldn't be in, in, in the audience with them you wouldn't be enjoying it you wouldn't because be because the kid that watched johnny carson go on stage on the tonight show in front of 60 or 70 million people who would have cue cards that he would be reading off of and then the fourth joke wouldn't work it was a dud but that's when you love johnny because then he got uncomfortable and then he'd start looking around and then he'd say fire that joke writer or whatever the case may be wow was that great and then doc would go or whatever the fuck is happening and ed mcmahon you just hear this like i don't know what's going on but that's the best part the jokes are great my parents are laughing at the political humor. But the twinkle in Johnny's eye when it would go off course. And by the way, I was savvy. Even as a kid, I knew some of this was probably intentional mistakes. Kind of, sort of. But what he did in those moments and what he did with it for the rest of the show and how he could call back to it, that's what that's the price of admission you pay right there to see that. Dane, if this podcast were four plus hours, I know that I would be able to get everything I wanted out of it. Okay. Um, but it won't be. And okay. I'd love to have you back. Okay. Uh, this isn't it at all. I just wanted to say I want to bring up a couple things that I wanted to talk Go about. Go for it, yes. Um, Lightning but, round. But also, we're not going to because I know you've talked about it a bit, but it ties into so much of what we've been going through. Mm-hmm. Um, you you had a career that was here uh, and at the top, and I don't know, maybe it's because I'm, I'm not from the 70s and the 80s. I'm, I know that you know Steve Martin did it, Eddie Murphy did it. All these people did their version of it. Sure. But in my generation, you were the one that that was the rock star and the pinnacle of it. Then you weren't. Well, that doesn't mean you weren't even funnier or anything. It just means that everybody has a certain type of shelf life. Right. And then you kind of did this again. And... There's this stigma. I remember you talked about it in the Theo episode. I didn't listen to it. Um, I saw clips. Theo Vaughn. Theo Vaughn, yeah. Yep. I remember you, and I wanted to get into it, but it's you talked about it and who knows. But the thesis of this, this mentality of being here and then Steve Martin walks away and you didn't, but then coming back. like it, Steve like, Martin walked away from stand-up. From stand-up. Yeah, he never enjoyed the echelon that he hit, that, that peak. Did not like that. I thought it was that he was he thought it's not going to get any higher so he left. Well, he did refer I think in his book he talked about like if there's a few empty seats uh I don't right. want you know I spoke with him. That's not what I got from the conversation I had with him. Uh he was like I just never loved it. 
I never loved that. I think that even you if, never loved stand up or I, empty seats. Uh, the no, the 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 enormity of it. I don't think he ever had a real based on conversations I've had with him. Conversation very specifically at a lunch. I just uh, it was where I said because he go he said to me you you look like you really love it up there, and I go I do, and he goes yeah I never had that. Did I that mean, hurt your feelings? No, looking up to him so much. No, 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 no. I still there's he's a fascinating character. He is a uh, he's very vastly different from who <laughs> you know you kind of. Imagine how somebody's going to be when you meet them. Very, Let me very interject different. real quick. Coincidentally, I just rewatched uh, House Sitter, and uh, I've been watching right. Only Murders in the Building with him right. and Martin. Short. I love it. My my um, uh, the Selena Gomez character. Uh, I'm the, we love it. Uh, Kelsey and I. I want to move back back to, to you about this. Okay. Uh, uh, pardon me, but Steve Martin will put aside. We're actually having him on in a couple of weeks. Okay. But you, um, you're, let's say out of one out of ten of how funny you are as a comedian in, in, from, in your career, right? right? You're a three, then you're a five, then you're a seven. Maybe you hit this echelon at a seven, and then you become an eight later, whatever it might be. Uh, right, The right. point I'm getting at is success, one of the variables in it is very much your talent. Uh, it's not the only one. Um, it's people connecting in that moment in time for whatever reason. And it's, I would imagine you, one could view their level of success as how good they are which uh, I don't think is true. Right. But when you are- Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, no. You don't link on, uh, no, exactly. There's There's no rhyme or reason. The greatest joke in the world that you love can fall flat and something that you think is tragically terrible can put you on the map. There's no real rhyme or reason as to like, to look at one thing and go, that's, the reason I hit that finish line or, or, or hit that echelon or whatever right. it is. And I never, I knew I took it. I knew quite simply it was like, I knew I'm going to b- bring this to the largest gatherings because I've already built the largest gathering. But I was also a student I'm of- I'm sorry, co- built the largest gathering. You're following? Of, of, of comedy fans, okay? So I knew I was going to fill whatever room I wanted to fill. Right. But I also was such a student of documentaries and- and and already maybe like even in in um, going down the rabbit hole of like re- reading reading about people's lives and careers and what longevity really was in a career, I never looked at it even after the biggest wave hit of those arenas and then it settled down. I didn't ever go, well, that's the best I'm ever going to get. There was never that kind of feeling. It was like I did that. I I I set out to accomplish in a hundred plus arenas, what I was hoping that I would do. But that that doesn't remain that way. I shouldn't even be trying to do that again. I should be trying to grow this audience in a new direction. And the only reason I can say comfortably that I was okay with reveling in it and then letting it's like somebody else is going to do that now was because my heroes, the Steve Martins or the Eddie Murphys, they parlayed into films. Into They grew up with families. They they started to find their audience was growing in a new and different direction. It wasn't just about nightclub comedy on an arena stage anymore. When you're at, at selling out uh, Madison Square Garden, you have your gathering, uh, and you know they're going to be there, uh, tell me how true or false this statement is. Okay. Whatever you do, relatively speaking to you not having that gathering, is going to work because they already like you. Uh, I think it's harder to come through for an audience that has so much anticipation. They've been listening to your albums for weeks or days leading up to that show. And so it's an event. Those shows especially, I would think of them as a vicious circle. The poster is like a comedy event because it is it is beyond just a comedy show. And so, but I like that because that- Why is it beyond a comedy show? Because of expectation? Yeah, because of, yes, because it's like, this is an expensive night for people to come out. This is more than just going down to the to the local comedy club. This is a full evening out, and they're going to get dinner, and they're probably going to pay for that expensive valet, and they're coming in at like this is a this is a raucous event. There's an energy and something beyond just like I hope these are some great new jokes we're going to hear tonight down at the local comedy club. And I was ready to deliver in that moment. There's an interview I forgot the interviewer, but we both have talked about it that we like of Johnny Carson, 
um, and he asks him about right. uh, this topic. And he right. says that when Bob Newhart goes out on stage, it's going to be easier for him than somebody the audience doesn't know because they already trust Bob Newhart. Right. Which but is kind of contradicting what you're but saying. Did he, but he, did he go on to say, but then the expectation of you've been listening to classic vintage uh, Bob Newhart, and then he's going to be talking about some new things that don't sound like those other things anymore. Isn't he, that isn't that what you need to do to continue thriving is to yeah. keep evolving and changing exactly. your stuff? Exactly. Exactly. So you need to be as dedicated to whatever that next period of your life and material in 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 self excavation, you know, the road gig journey inward because I my philosophy is they're they're more engaged with somebody being truthful and honest in a moment than they are about whether the material is really the funniest possible version of a car accident story. It's how you're reveling in the telling of that story. So you could really be talking about anything. And I think that that's what people lock into with great musicians or great anything. Anybody on a stage, I think that's where the allure is. How patient, how patient do you have to be with the process of, of uh, the audience is coming to see me and they love me, and I have to meet expectations. But also, I'm going to be talking about my parents having passed away. I, th I, I think I came to the Laugh Factory way before we met, and I saw you. What was that set? What was that special that Isolated you filmed incident. There? I talked quite a bit about my mom. And it was, it was a darker set. And I remember, right. I remember thinking, I had just started doing stand-up. And I remember thinking that, like, I wonder if people are going to, this isn't what they came to see. I loved it. Right. Um, and it was interesting. Right. But it wasn't it wasn't the pickles, you know, it wasn't that right. friendly thing. And, and and thank God, because can you imagine if you walked in and I was doing the pickles? You would you it you think you would have laughed, but you would not have laughed. But that's what I'm wondering when you're saying that Because like, we've seen performers over the years play the song that put them on the map some years ago, and unless it's a fucking great song and truly stands the test of time. It's a little sad. Dude, to I watch saw somebody. I saw a comic at the Hollywood uh, at the uh, Cleveland Improv, but way before I, I mean, before I moved out here, right? And then a decade later, I saw him at the Laugh Factory doing that set. Doing the same thing, and it and he's very successful, by the way. Right? What the fuck? Okay. But that, but but you saying that pressure of like making people get what they came for, but you knowing it has to be different. But but you're also, I was I was onto something that you don't probably realize that I I understood, which was. When I first started doing colleges, and my dad's like, you should play a lot of colleges. And here's my dad, never in the industry, athlete. How do you know what I should do? Because the things that you discover in your college years, you'll take with you for the rest of your life. That's what he said to me. I'm like 20 years old. I went, that's pretty genius. He also once said, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd, which is what I thought of when I started MySpace, which was what my dad said to me. Those two Why? things. Why? Because people are like, oh, they like him, I must. Because if people see a crowd, you've got a second once the rubbernecks look in to truly entertain them with something or are they going to go like oh this is stupid let's keep walking how does your dad know to tell you that if right. he's not a performer i mean maybe he just had that understanding from i don't know i don't know he just the the thing about the the things that you take with you in those college years you bring with you for the rest of your life i, I don't know when he told it to me i remember just feeling like like eureka That's so like, he says it you're like that makes sense so i already understood by the time I was on my first Comedy Central premium blend or half hour. Was that the, the wife beater one? Yes. I'm already knowing I've grown up for 10 years already with college kids. They've graduated. Now they're trying to find jobs. You've done stand-up for 10 years, and that's your first half hour. 98 was premium blend, and then the half hour Comedy Central presents is like 2000. It's 10 years of, from 1990, I'm, there's college kids that I've been performing. Maybe even high schools that I, I play, like early gigs. I'm already understanding that I am growing up with a generation of comedy fans, okay? So it's incumbent upon me to keep growing. Otherwise, it's going to be the same song and dance, and as they grow and have families and move on, I'm still over there doing pickles and pouring water on myself. And that was, I, I realized very early, that's, that's not going to cut it. That's the, that's the answer to how to become... Um, a has been. How much? How trying to relive something that you did before? 
you're very different as a comedian now. I haven't seen you in a few years. I mean, I haven't seen anybody in a few years, I guess, at this point. Right. But um, I discovered you before I knew you, and then I've seen you. And uh, I mean, you're still Dane Cook. You still do the, the, the longer words, and there's like this voice that you have. Uh, it's very different. And um, I've heard people say, uh, uh, also, full candor, I mean, I know you know this stuff already, but like people have, people have talked a lot of shit about you. And, what? uh, you, you know, you, you get shit. Um, you, you wouldn't want it any other way and t until people are, you know, nagging at you, it's, you're not doing something right. Bobby Lee brings up how Mitzi, uh, a couple of times, uh, I've heard him say how Mitzi Shore would say that, uh, you need half, I don't know if I agree with the, the exact number, but he said, you need half the room to hate you. I don't, I don't think half the room you want to hate you, but that idea of if, uh, if you're affecting people, you're going to affect them on the spectrum of the. Uh, of the emotions, positively and negatively. Yeah, sure. You need cheers and jeers. But I bring that up because uh, I think that people, this is related to you, but in, when people critique, because people are people will critique because it's easy to do. Right. Um, they have their mind made up of you that they maybe didn't make up. They heard it. Uh, and I've seen, because I've done shows with you, that so I'm tagged in them. Um, uh, I'm, uh, Dane was actually pretty funny. <laughs> and like that kind of stuff. Like, well, you know... Why did you think he wasn't? Not that they had to think you were, but right. why did they have this opinion? Right. Um, what other people think of me is none of my business. And I think I tapped out of trying to understand all the hows and whys about that because you're not really thinking about the person that's suddenly impressed, even though it's, I guess it's kind of humorous when, you, when we talk about it here. You're thinking of all the other people that are like, hey, thank you for coming through for me on another great night of comedy. This is the 50th time I've seen you from the Laugh Factory to... So, yeah, there's always going to be... Yeah, it's interesting to talk about the person like, I didn't think it was going to be good, and then, but... Well, that's, that's to me different. Doesn't... That's different than the... I get on... I, I guest on people's podcasts, and when I'm a guest on podcasts, it's different. Right. I'm not worried about them being in my house. There's not the hosting energy. It's just different. And uh, I've been getting... Uh, I've seen comments where... Um, I never liked Glassman. He's you read so, comments? Yeah. Uh. I, I understand you're not supposed to. Uh, I probably, I, I read them, yeah. Right, and people know you read them. I mean, I've, I've talked about it on here, yeah. Mm. I don't read every comment, but pop, more than I don't. Right, read three, and then everything after that is like... They're pretty positive, and there are negative ones. Even those, it's not, that's not so good to read. That, well, sure. Do you need someone else to qualify... I enjoyed your comedy if you already know that you felt good entertaining people. You know, I, I know how I want to answer that. Um, th th but this sound and ha 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 is really the answer to the question. Beyond that, it's... The, the, truth, the truth is... Is everybody like... Go ahead. The truth is that... I want the truth. Uh, I, spent a, I spent a lot of time on this thing, literally on the computer on okay. this, which includes... On what? The podcast. Okay. Which includes being on YouTube and being on social for work. Okay. And they're there. You, the notifications are there. Right. And uh, I read them because I haven't decided not to. And yes, um, nice comments make me feel good. Mm. Bad comments, usually I laugh at because, you know, it's like a heckler who doesn't realize that I, I'm better at this than you. But when I see something like what I was about to bring up of, I, uh, I never liked Glassman until I saw him on this. He's so funny. Right. Or something where they think they're complimenting me, but I now see somebody right. who's not hating on me, who actually feels they're connecting with me. Right. And what if in a year from now you say something that they uh, doesn't jive with their? Well, it's more and, about. And then suddenly they're like, "Man, I was really starting to like that guy, and I'm tapping out, man. Sorry, you were going in a direction that suddenly you're. It's like your integrity is is uh, is being you're, you're being malleable in your integrity to somebody else's opinion, whether you're doing something that entertains them because what because you can't be that for everybody so everybody that it's comes that. in with a comment it's that it's that those people usually the thing they have to say about me that that is a, a negative is one that's like oh, i know like i agree like what it's just you know i'm sure i'll get them on this why did rick have to go off subject of this or da, da, da? it's like i know man i'm not fucking perfect it's hard Right. So and, they're saying neither, what I'm saying. And neither is that person. And if you think that without even having a face to the name, it, it kind of makes all that dissipate. You, the fact that somebody would even feel the need to log in and have to express that to you is somewhat sad that they would need to... 
to, it, it to tell you that. It doesn't that, get that, in the way. That, some, that someone would know that quite possibly they're causing somebody pain with their negative take, it really, that's all, that tells you everything about that person before you even read more than a few words. In Isolated Incident, I did the material about the email that I got about your mom and dad died of cancer to get away from your shitty comedy. That whole last bit was exactly what we're talking about. You, your career started from your ability to connect to people uh, one-on-one, -on -one, MySpace, and responding to social media and comments, right? which is the exact opposite of what we're talking about right now. Right. You don't have to do that anymore. I still feel like, and I've thought about numerous times you telling me you bought a chair, you bought like a really expensive computer chair That's right. that you couldn't afford at the time. True. And you're like, I know I'm, I, I, I know I want to be sitting in this chair to right. be doing this thing. I think I think about that often because sometimes I don't comment back to people because there's this weird thing of like, you don't want to be too available, even though I saw it. And, and I go back for it. And sometimes when I decide I wanted to respond, I think of what you did. Right. That's part of the game. And, and now more since you started it. I was fortunate, though, when I started it, there was a pretty good number of years where it was like the golden era of the Internet. And there was a lot of... Uh, excitement around the internet i know it sounds silly now but people love it still the, the the access and the portal instantly cross country to say hello to somebody that they liked or in that wore off after about four or five years how did it wear off i mean social media is huge no that was oh, just not the, a novelty the, the, no no the, the 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 goodwill and very little um, oh, so people got mean after four years. Somebody finally went, hey, you can write cunt in these comments. <laughs> right, right, and if right. they don't let you write it, you can put a thing in between. Like somebody finally cracked the code of, hey, you can, uh, you can be anonymous and you can go in here and you can rage at your, you can, you can, you, for whatever reason, you can get in there and you can, you can, you can directly connect and quite potentially hurt somebody's feelings or, or beyond. And then that became a thing. Are you advising that I don't interact with, with I'm saying that digitally. the kid that was doing MySpace back then that would probably have said to you like, "Oh man, like you know, every comment that comes in, you can you can correspond with." I I wouldn't say that that's the right way to do things now because unfortunately people have abused it and they know it's sadly access to you know ca causing you know saying vicious you know things and, and 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 hurting people's feelings at the you know kind of the surface level what i would say today is get on something like clubhouse and change the narrative by actually moderating and having conversation and protecting yourself with people that love what you do work with you collaborate with you and create communities and that's what i do in clubhouse and the reason i'm on clubhouse and it's i'm calling it like myspace 2.0 is because i'm changing the narrative again but i'm not having to go through um comment sections of you know i'm happy to do something that feels it's like part of what i'm doing like right. i'm i'm interacting with i'm talking to us you know i'm talking to them too right hi going to clubhouse or something <laughs> that feels like going to work it does me. i mean i tried it it's not for me okay no disrespect shout out to clubhouse with instagram and here but like <laughs> i i like this like this is me con connecting to an audience can i tell I, you why i love it because it's the ultimate improv. Because you bring people onto the stage with you and you can be joking, you can be off the cuff, you can be uh, you know, talking about something, side items and silly and superfluous, and then all of a sudden. Don't yell at me. And then. Don't yell at me. Go ahead, go for it. I think you're gonna. <laughs> well, what do you think I was gonna and, do? And, and, then, and then what I like about it is similar to how stand-up at its best is when you've got your formula and then it becomes non-formulaic and you both are dancing together. It's the exact same thrill I have, but now I get to do it without having to lead to a punchline, without it needing to, and people understand that. That's how I feel about the people podcast. People are conditioned there. That's how I feel about the podcast. Right. It's so nice to right. not have to, and way bigger than the podcast. It's so nice to, I don't want to speak for you, I'll speak for me, to be reminded that you have value other than being funny or right. silly or weird. Right. And it's, it's uh, well, eyes are going to water and I'm going to be sniffing on this. Go ahead. I'm going to um, let you have that moment. Um, <laughs> you you want to, I want to be funny. 
You know, not because I want to be funny. You but are funny. We're funny. It's, it's uh, I think I've talked about this on a podcast. Um, when I was younger, I didn't realize that I didn't realize how people were feeling about me. It's not like I thought, I don't know. Wait, you didn't realize. I could explain it. I'll give an example. Okay. I didn't think, I wonder how Dane's feeling about me. I knew how Dane was feeling about me. Okay. I just was wrong. I always knew wrongly that whatever I was feeling about myself, so was everybody else. If I was down on wow. myself, if, if I'm hilarious. Okay. You might need to follow the bouncing ball moment with that one because that was a lot. Do you get what I'm saying now? I kind of, I can't lie. No. All right. Here, here's what it is. Um, I couldn't pick up on social cues. I didn't see, right. I didn't know that this person was doing this meant that they wanted to go. I didn't know that they were annoyed. They, I didn't realize they were changing the subject, and I kept trying. Okay. I didn't pick up on, unless somebody said, Ricky, I don't want to hear you anymore, I would keep going. Okay. Does that make sense? Th yeah. Right. One thing I always knew was that when people were laughing, there was a connection. Okay. Right? Right. So I have, I have been conditioned to believe that the only way to connect with people is by laughing with them. And making so if I'm not making them laugh, I'm disconnected from them. Does that make sense? Yes. Then I get into stand up. So not only do I am I now my my well being is based on I'm like I need to make a living. Everything about everything I'm doing, if I don't get a laugh, they don't like me. I'm gonna be poor. And I'm trying. <laughs> they don't like me. I'm gonna be poor. That's where you go. Yeah. Wow. If you don't laugh, it yeah. means I'm not gonna get fucked. I'm not gonna eat. I'm not gonna have a career. I'm not gonna have friends. That wasn't a conscious thought, by sure. the way. It's just how much you're seeking it. Right. And it was very, very hard to get laughs. Um, uh, with all that pressure, I, I understand that. Yeah, well... You basically should just have hired an assassin to be up in the back I corner didn't know of the... This. I didn't know this is what I was doing. <laughs> with the glint coming off the sniper scope, knowing, like, if I don't get laughs, I'm fucking dead. I didn't know this about myself. I understand. And... What I found was that uh, the one way to get laughs <laughs> right. was to be laughed at, um, not to play. I just I'm weird, and people were sometimes people were laughing. I didn't even know what they were laughing at. Right. So then you lean into this weird sure. shtick, and okay. and then you develop a craft around it. And for the first eight plus years of my of my stand up career, I was building bits where I am the fool, and being doing these things on purpose. Okay. How did you feel about yourself doing them? Were you were you enjoying it at the moment, not looking back now at yes, seeing it? because I'm finally in control. Okay. I'm finally able to get the laughs when I want, when I'm able to, I'm saying relatively speaking. I understand. I'm finally yeah. able when to- When you're in the pocket and it's hitting, you're like, this is uh, what I set Dane, out to do. I've, uh, the first eight years of stand-up, I was in the pocket, I'd say probably 15 times. Okay. And it's the only reason I'm still doing it, because I tasted that this is possible. But it's so, 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 so What do you hard. think it was different about those nights? Knee jerk. What was different about those nights? I, I got them once. <laughs> okay. I have to, I guess by that, I mean, they got me once. Yeah. Something happened where they, they, were, they, they, they did this. Oh. Right. I but see what he's you're, doing. You're present. I, I would argue that I, I was already. I think right. as hard as it is and as all the things that I that my obstacles didn't, the reason that I'm able to do well enough is because of the being present. Okay. That's yeah. but that's not enough. You know, it's like when you're in a relationship, love isn't enough. There needs to be other things. There needs right. to be friendship and blah blah blah. Right. Needs to be comments in the comment section. Letting you know that the relationship is robust and uh yeah i guess i mean sure I, is is the joke that imagine if your relationship was dictated by comments as well as a career um there was a remember i told you that I, the way the way you feel about me is how i feel about me that's what i thought okay when i'm on stage and i'm fucking hysterical i thought they just and when it wasn't working i didn't think i wasn't being funny i thought they don't they don't realize i'm being funny it was not their fault but like you ever get laughs and you think, come on, this isn't that great. You guys are wrong. I know that feeling. I understand It's the that. same as the opposite. Right. When you're being funny, you're like, what the fuck is going on? I'm being fucking hysterical. It's because they aren't there with you yet. Sure. Um, the, uh, <laughs> it was very hard to get them to be there with me. I have learned, for better or worse, that it is the first... I mean, I know your opening joke is important, but I need to do a joke at the beginning that is that lets them in on who I am or I won't succeed. 
I'm going on too much. I'm getting insecure about this conversation. Why? Though. No, I, I think it's. I mean, I'm, I'm talking too much about me. And I my think process. we're a little in the weeds for for the casual listener. To be honest, I think like comics especially are going to love this because this is like sitting around the table and really trying to. This reminds me of 30 years of what I've enjoyed about offstage, which is let's sit together, put your hand like this, and go, "Fuck, man, that worked." But why didn't that work? Do you think it's the shirt I wore? To like, I think was it ever the shirt? Whatever, man. You you. There was a number of reasons that you think like, wow, man, I was funnier when I wore a long sleeve shirt. Like weird shit at the beginning of your career, and then you just start to learn. I think what you start to understand is what's making me funny. What's 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 allowing me to connect with these people is I've done it so much yeah. that there's no fucking desperation and there's no please, please like me. I've just done it enough that that's not even coming to the stage with me. There's still pressure. There's still a lot of things that I want to accomplish. But once you don't have that permeating off you, I think you start to get different kinds of laughs. I'm there. I saw uh, a comedian, I'll say his name. I saw Greg Fitzsimmons at the beginning of his career. And then I watched him and it was like, the writing's funny. It, it, but just something was missing. And then I, I think I said this to Greg on his podcast. Then I watched him figure it out. Something happened over the course literally of like four weeks in Boston. And Greg Fitzsimmons was always funny after yeah. that. Dane, I, I, I'm, I, I am there. I'm not here, but I figured that out. And uh, uh, the podcast, and this is bringing this back together, is reminding me of that because that need to be funny that I never realized I needed realizing that I don't need that is what helped. And this podcast is great. One, because it's long form. I can't, we can't be nonstop. This isn't a comedy special, first right. of all. And also reading these comments and, you know, we attract a certain type of audience. You attracted a lot of hot girls and college guys. I attract a lot of socially awkward, uh, autistic Jews. And a lot of them relate to this thing so much that I didn't realize, oh, this is, yeah, this is how people think. Right. And, it is very validating as much as, you know, I thought Rick fucking sucked to get those, to read people say, um, there's been four people that have reached out that didn't realize that this thing that they think that they see in me, not only did they realize it, they went and got uh, diagnosed with autism. Okay. And not that it's about autism, just about this thing of like, oh, they could see themselves in me. It's very validating. I don't think it's unhealthy. Maybe I'm wrong to be like this thing, me talking to you about me being insecure about changing this. That's real. Right. And if you don't like that, you're not going to watch this podcast. Right. It's very nice. And now trying to, since this podcast has been doing better recently, I'm now only starting to do stand-up since people know me from this. Right. To be able to talk about this kind of stuff on stage. It's allowing you to get rid of all the, forgive me, anything hokey, you don't need to bring that. They know you. There's, a, there's already a, an understanding of who's taking the stage. So there's nothing superfluous. It's like you get to come in and be right in the pocket because people know your voice. That's the word, right? They, they know you. They kind of have an idea of what to expect when they come to see the show. A guy came up to me at the comedy store a few nights ago uh, to take a picture with me, mm -hmm. which, by the way, has been happening and is very cool, and yeah. it's while I'm wearing a mask. Right. They want to take a picture with me, right. uh, and he goes like this before he does it. He goes, hey, I, I know that you're – I won't get too close. You know, like it wasn't a COVID thing. It was a he knows how I am with everything. Right, right, right. Don't and, and I'm like, I'll take my my mask off, but be in front of me. He's like, I'm gonna be in front of you. Big fan, you know. But like, yeah, dude. That not only that they like me and want to meet me, which is very rewarding and cool. But like that that hack, like hack in, not like cheat. That oh, they already know this. Right. So I don't have to go up. I mean, I still you sh I need to. Not everyone will know me, but like. What I think Johnny Carson was saying about um, Bob Newhart, which is like, they already get it enough. And I could talk about this thing that I thought nobody would understand or be interested in. Right. That's, that's, a, that's if, what this and, podcast is. And if they know that and they see me. you leaning into something that you're enjoying on stage with the familiarity, then you're in it. That, that something special is happening. And then you can be formulaic, non form I'm going to lean into the routine. I want to, ah, I'm going to yap. I just want to, and that's, where you hopefully want your career to exist in everything that you do. That level of like lean into something. I, Rick, stop talking about this too much. I'm reading you a comment. Um, but I gotta say, uh, I know that once we brought up some stuff in the middle of this podcast and went like this and da da da, but 
this is like <laughs> I am very. I hope you're enjoying this. I love but it. This is like um. This is very nice, and I want to be having this conversation. Right. And also, there's something very nice um, about that I'm having it with somebody who has, I mean, y- you've done a lot in a way that uh, I relate to. Like, uh, like, oh, he's, I've told you this, but I mean, there are so many comments. I might want to grab them and put them up. <laughs> That uh, what is this, Dane Cook? What is this, Dane Cook? Everyone says I found out about people have said that we have a similar it, uh, cadence. Cadence. Um, I found out about you. I'm told you this before, but I'm talking to them, I guess. Okay. Uh, I was playing basketball in college, and uh, three different people in a week, different games. They weren't. They didn't hear it. A call saying, "All right, Dane Cook, I don't know who you are yet." All right. And then I I watch you, and I didn't see that, but I loved you. Right. So. That has stayed in, and then we become friends. And also, I think it's kind of a cool story, so I'll bring this up. You were the first person, I think, probably. There are two people I could think of, you and Lamorne, but you were first, uh, and it's a different version of it, where you and Brent Morin knew each other from the Laugh Factory, I think. Right. Shout out to Brent Morin. And he goes, uh, he, was, he was chatting with you while we were walking. Okay. We live in the same building. And he said what you're supposed to say when he's chatting with you. He's like, dude, I'm talking to Dan Cook. You know, like the guy that we like that somehow for some reason has my number now. Right. And there was a, I'll, I mean, there was a super, there was a transparent transact. Like I straight up told Brent, I want to be friends with Dan Cook. You know, like, and then we started talking and there was definitely this thing of like, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 your enthusiasm when we first met, I was, uh, I appreciated that. Because you weren't doing some Hollywood like, uh, hey, to, you were very, you were, you were, you were yourself, and I, I like that right off the bat. I do wonder if I could benefit from being able to like not show everything right away, but yeah, though, um, thank you for saying that. That same thing I've heard opposite. Yeah, from people. there's, a, yeah, that's a the politics game and the things that you're supposed to do going into the room and all that. Like, that's not for the creatives. I don't think. I think when you meet somebody, you can say like, and I will genuinely meet somebody and say, man, I'm. I can't believe I get to meet you. I'm a huge fan of yours. It's like, I think when somebody comes at you like that instead of a put on, that's a nice way to start a friendship. That's how I met Lamorne. I walked up and I'm a, right. I'm a big fan and now he's on the podcast. So check right, it right, out. Right, right, right. Cool. Uh, uh, <laughs> so anyway, this conversation, uh, it feels more than just uh, connecting and talking about it. it. Like there's little nuggets you look for. Right. You get out of it. And one of them is an intangible of just being able to tell you this stuff feels nice. Yeah. You know, so uh, as much as we may have fallen off the bike or whatever, and I don't even want to end this yet, but I know we, we got to and soon enough. We can part two this. If we get uh, good comments in the comment section and they say, bring that Dane Cook kid back, then we'll, why don't we do this again? But uh, if you get bad comments, then you should listen to the people that you'll never know and make your decisions going forward based on those comments. Yeah. See what I just did? Yeah. I laid it on a little thick. Yeah, I guess I'll check the comments and decide. <laughs> Don't read the comments. But could, could you give me can, 10 more but, minutes so I can ask I, you a couple more things? Uh, yeah, of course. Let's do that. But can I just, can I add one, uh, hopefully, uh, nice little umbrella, uh, rainbow, uh, frown? I, th- I think you'll enjoy your career, anybody, so much more when you understand people are going to leave. People are going to come and go. And that if you hit a echelon, if you're the bell of the ball, if you, uh, I believe that uh, you can have many moments, right? Many high, you're, at the end of your life, when your ESPN highlight reel, you know, moments uh, reel starts to play, if you just understand the whole way, you're not collecting everybody to say like, oh, please all stay with me. It's, it's like love. If you let people go, they will check back in and many of them will come back. I'm the test of that. Why? Because I broke so young and I was so in touch with people at that age. I had people be my number one fan. I had people come to me years later and say, I, I'm no longer a fan. I didn't like isolate, I, whatever it might be. And then I've had them come and be like, this is my son. We're here at your show tonight. And he hates you too. I, lo- <laughs> I was right here seven say, years ago, you fuck. <laughs> you should be doing the pickles joke tonight. We... Fell in love with you from pickles. <laughs> no, I'm, go ahead, go ahead. That's but that but if you understand that that it's all out of your control, and the one thing that's in your control is 
is showing up and loving what you do for the people that do want to see you, regardless of a number, regardless of if there's any comments in the comment section. And just listening to the one thing that matters is either you hear this or ha, ha. If you can boil it back down to that, the way you didn't boil my tea water and it was lukewarm. And the pickles, and the pickles, and the <laughs> bars and tone. The whole point is this: people will will come and go, and that and and if you're understanding of that, then it makes your progress and and. And you feel less obligated to live up to a comment in a comment section. And you understand that, hey, my life is seasons. People will come and go. And hopefully someday they'll come in and go, man, I'm, I'm glad. It, and I know this because people will say, I'm glad I came back and right. came to your show. So it's, it's great. That's two things, three things. One, I uh, love that. Two, now this smells a little bit like a burp. And three. <laughs> I actually had a three, but I think that's what it might be. Uh, the comments are still making me feel... It's not just... It, to see that people are this way, too, Right, feels good. And maybe I should stop reading them. I don't know. I just... I've never liked comments. That, that's even before the internet. It's, you know, like life and kids in the corner and school and whispering. And I was always a wallflower and awkward. I, the, the com I understand. People tell comments, me that. Comments, man. It's just... Most of the time, comments are just somebody who's not going to... Sorry to offend you if you're one of these people, but it's usually somebody who's not able to get up and try for themselves. You're talking about negative comments. And they're just, yeah, and they're just a little fucking persnickety that you're a go-getter and you're trying. That bothers people. The fact that you try and they don't have the ability to, to light a fire under their own ass to do that, it bothers people. And then they want to tell you. And then you know what? When they finally have a moment, when they finally have a moment, then they'll go, guess what? I, I just wanted to write you because I know I wrote some shitty things years ago, but I'm enjoying my life now. And you know what? That's not for you either. That's for them. Mm -hmm. The whole fucking thing, yeah. the bad comment and then telling you, I'm sorry. And now I'm okay. It's like, great. I'm still doing what I do. I love what I do. How do you connect the difference between a comment versus the reaction of an audience? That's the reaction of the audience is in the room. You know if a joke works or doesn't. So it's, it's based on... It's based on um, molding the set. Right. You would never, I would, I couldn't imagine doing a show and then being like, no, everybody write your comments about my yeah, jokes. Yeah. And when I leave here, I'm going to read all of them and decide my integrity and, and where I'm going to go with this. So the difference between MySpace, Dane, and that is you were in a four year pocket where people were just excited. Nice. It was like, it was like a gold rush of like, you get to share space with people that you like from the television. Cause they're but, not used to being able to have access. But you gotta remember, I was also a Boston kid. I already had some attitude and my disclaimer on my site was don't fucking follow me if you're not a fan of risks. Cause I'm going to take a lot of them. So I was already telling you, I'm going to do shit that you won't like. I'm going to do dramatic film. I'm going to maybe do a TV show that might be kind of sitcom-y and, and not the kind of humor with the uh, adult, adult language. I'm going to do stuff. Don't fucking be here if you don't like that I'm going to try and maybe fail or sometimes succeed in something you don't like. I said, that was mission statement 1999. That was on my, like, my main page. So I was already preparing myself for that feeling of if I take this to where I think I'm going to take it, there's only one way it goes after that, which is a rebuild. You got to, uh, I did that. Eddie Murphy did, ah, and then he did Pluto Nash a few years later, and everybody said his career is over because he was like, I want to do family films now. I did the stand up act to a fucking stadium. I can't. I don't want to keep doing that in a leather suit. But yours is yours is stand up still. I mean, I know you want to, you act and you've been in shows and movies. But is stand up still? Stand up is always going to be the the because the, they stopped doing it. The, the center of my life. It, it still is. I mean, I can, will I stop doing it? I can't imagine myself not doing it because I love it as much today as I did when I started. But I also identify. I want my next special. 
I'm going to take stand-up. The one I, that you're filming, the tickets are on sale. It feels October, October 29th, 29th and, 30th. and 30th. There's still tickets available in, in Boston, and it's going to be an epic uh, event. But the special I'm doing there is not, in my eyes, not just another comedy special. It's moving the needle to where I think comedy specials need to be. Where so there's that? an aesthetic. I don't want to give away what I'm working on with my you're crew. You're saying what you're about to do, comedy specials don't do yet. I, I feel like I'm as excited about the, the set, but I'm also as excited about the way I did Vicious Circle, and it was about the aesthetic, and then Isolated was about 60-minute one shot, no cuts. There's not one edit in that whole set. I feel like I'm going to do something again that... Does I, that mean it was one camera? Yeah. I, I don't think I remember that or knew that. Real time, 60 minutes. Cool. So whatever but one that, camera still. One camera, 60-minute set, no, no breaks. What, no was there only one camera there, or were there multiple yeah, and you there was just one, one on, a, on a, a dolly in the back. Was there, was there a rehearsal for where you want certain shots to be, or did you just... Mm -hmm. th no, it who, was who like... directed that? Marty Colner. And Marty knew. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do in this little chunk, but, you know... And he's he like, knew oh. the set, though. He knew the set. He knew most of the material. I did a couple of things that night that I was like, oh, I'm, I'm changing something up. Back of the room, Dolly, and he would put, he would uh, telephoto, I would imagine. You'd a pull. little bit, yeah, just a little bit of in and out. And then the whole theme was monochromatic. If you remember, I turned the whole Laugh Factory into it. was Everything was black, white, or gray. And it's called Isolated Incident, and, and that's also in black, white, and gray because I knew I was in a moment in my life where it would never be all of those things like it was. Parents dying, my brother's in prison, I'm coming off the highest point in a comedy career, and there is no higher point to go. And I know it. I've Meaning been selling to, out stadiums. I've been to the summit, right. right? And I'm like, this is it. And this is where every comic wants to get to, and I know it. I can do something else now. I can grow into a new direction. This isn't a smaller venue. This is a different venue. Is that what you're saying? Well, it was like I went from an arena. I did Vicious in Boston Garden, uh, Rough Around the Edges in Madison Square Garden, and then I did isolated incident in front of 300 people at the Laugh Factory. And it was to say, my kind, what, what is interesting to me is not a bigger crowd. What is interesting to me is what I bring to a crowd. Could you have done a stadium at that point or no? Oh, yeah. I still could have done a couple of more. I, I mean, I have... You could have filmed full, that full special at a stadium? Full disclosure, this is a little bit of like breaking news. I have over 100 arena shows filmed. All the improv, all the stuff that I did off the cuff, all the stuff where somebody attacks me on stage in front of 20,000 people and I got in a, basically a fist fight with a guy. So I'm piecing together 100 arena. The arena and stadium, the same thing? Uh, no, stadium is like uh, like usually 70,000. Uh, like Gator Growl. is Football like a, is a stadium, basketball is an arena. Right, gotcha. Yeah. So like, like Dice 30, was 000. playing stadiums. Dice was playing fucking like... Uh, uh, I don't remember, somewhere in New York. Like he was playing like Shea Stadium or whatever it was. But I knew for me, I mean, and by the way, you would never want to be out. Like I did Gator Growl at a stadium, 70,000 people. If you want to be so turned off by that many people laughing with no ceiling, it's it's like they laugh and it's like this. <sighs> it's just, it's that was rough. Um, but yeah, I could have continued to 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 do that but I didn't need to do that anymore. I didn't feel the need in me to go, I need to do only arenas. I was back at the Laugh Factory the year after both of those shows, having as much fun preparing Isolated in front of 300 people because I had the idea of like, oh, 60 minutes, one shot. So this next special, this next you know piece of my life journal in comedy is I think something that I think I think comics are going to look at what I'm putting together and go. That's the way we need to do it now. I want to add uh, the whole podcast. I've been I don't know if I've been seeking, but I know I haven't heard something yet that I want to try and see if there's something that exists there. I'll try to fart, but I don't think I have it in me. Just lift, ladies and gentlemen. Dane Cook, stick around to right now though, <laughs> where I still ask this question. It seems like everything, at least that we've talked about so far. You knew then what you what you know now in a way. Like, I'm not like a prognosticator. I I I I'm not I'm not a soothsayer. What are you saying? Like I knew I, I you had knew inklings. that before you got to hear that, you know, because of Eddie Murphy and all these people that you're gonna go here. And you knew that, you know, as long as I have right. it here, and you knew that if right. I show up I knew I knew it's 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 interpreted as um the media likes to comebacks, and that was the biggest thing you did, and that's that's the sound bites, and that's the that's the story kind of written for you. But I know that the journey of somebody who's uh, a uh, creator, an artist, 
we're not that doesn't actually have anything to do with truly the progress and the possibility that lives inside somebody and the ways that we want to move people. Do you understand? So I did that and I went, ha ha, I did that. I had a feeling I was going to do that. And then when that echelon or that, that plateau and I came down the other side of it and unfortunately into a lot of hardship with my family, I was accepting of like, I accomplished that. I set out to accomplish that. And now I look forward to growing in a new direction with my fans. But where is the shift? I want to tell you mine. And here's maybe there's other ones, but here's okay. one that I remember. Yeah. Um, you know, we still have room to grow and blah, 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 blah. But there was a moment, and it happened in the main room at the comedy store, uh, was one of those, I, they put me up last, and there's, you know, it, there was 300 people at the beginning of the show, and now there's, you know, 25 spread throughout. One right. of those types of shows. Right, right. And uh, I'm not getting all the laughs, right? Okay. But I saw everybody in the audience, and I first noticed it because of, of a couple in the front, and I look around, and it was, it was like a conscious recognition. Mm -hmm. I saw everybody doing this, looking at me, smiling a little, okay. but waiting, wanting, right. paying attention. Right. And I wasn't getting laughs. Yeah, I wasn't getting that many laughs. Okay. But I realized, I called my dad right after, and I realized mm -hmm. I'm interesting. People want to hear me. Right. Get funnier and get more interesting, but I didn't know that I was until that moment. And this wasn't my career changed, but it is when I realized, oh, and here's a very corny term that I use, I've used on this before, and it's necessary for me. I feel special. There's, I have something that, I have something at least, right? Right. right. And that gave me moving forward um, confidence to always then after feel I might have a bad set, I might not, but like, I should be doing this. There's, uh, there's something that I should be doing. Sure. It's been validated in different ways, but there was that moment. Was there something for you before that, before that moment, before Dublin's, right. before you realized I had this stuff where, uh, and what was it, if there's a moment where you're like, oh, I'm, there's some, I have something that other people don't have in my way. Two years into my stand-up comedy career, I was featuring, and some of the local, uh, Boston guys, mostly men, were headliners in Boston, and they were we they were they were we would call them the 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 terms back then were like he's a murderer, right? We would say that just a killer room, bombastic, roof blown off, and I was having great sets in the middle, and then I had a, a club middle owner, of your set or middle of the, the feature. Set the feature set is like I would go on right before these one of these monster headliners. And I had a manager come to me after a couple of nights opening for this headliner and said, hey, can you maybe like just tone it down and not so kill so hard in the middle? Like try to- But saying that for real. Yeah, yeah. Telling me, try to be more a little more tepid with, I was really knocking it out of the park in that middle spot. And I spoke up for myself, which was probably also something I remember recalling this, which was like, I, I, I wasn't very good at that at that time. I was still very kind of like beta. And I leaned into an alpha moment and I said, well, if, if you think I'm that funny, then let me headline. Just let me Did headline. Did you say it to the club or to the headline? No, to the manager of this oh, the man I misunderstood. Eating place. The manager yeah, yeah, no. Whoever's running that night to, got yeah. the note, tell the middle act kid, don't kill so hard because the headliner was going like, he's making it tough on me. And I knew that. But I also knew if I don't <laughs> headline, I'm never leaving Boston, right? I mean, I'm never going to get better if I stay a feature act under the best of the best in New England. Where, where does that... I saw where that was taking other people, which was- You think the, other in, people were being told to tone it down and they did tone it down? I just, no, I think they were already toned down. And I saw that like, if you weren't uh, doing something unique in that middle spot, you never became the headliner. But there was already people locked into the headliner spots that had those spots and didn't want somebody else coming up the ranks. I was the next generation of comic coming up. And that's when you knew you were the next generation? And that's when I, uh, I don't, wouldn't say that, but that's when I had an understanding that's when something was validated even to me where I probably looked in the mirror that night and said, uh, don't, you know, don't forget how you feel tonight. They're intimidated by you. And, and then it was like probably being very honest, like <laughs> I'm, I, I'm so not controversial, but I became controversial and I laughed at that. I'm so not trying to be intimidating, but 
somebody's intimidated by my act. So it was kind of like a, I, the way you called your dad, I went home and said, mom, they told me I needed to be less funny in the middle. And she was like, oh, fuck them, honey. You should just go up and just keep killing. Just do your thing. Then you'll be the headliner. And that's what they did. A year later, they had me in those headlining spots. Um, I had a similar kind of, the, at least the, the, all the, the variables are there, but in different orders of when I did one of my first uh, headlining. It was somewhere in Florida. I don't remember where. And fr uh, Friday I, or Thursday, first show Thursday, whoa. I remember like, I figured this out. Right. And then the second show, Friday, uh, I had just broken up with a girlfriend at the time <laughs> and a high school, like, you know, weeks, a month, two months, I don't know, before that. You're right. Um, a girl that I haven't seen since high school, a decade ago, uh, is lives in Florida now. And, oh, I saw about your, your girlfriend. I love her so much. And there's something, yeah. I don't remember. I love the pictures. I don't remember what it was. But it just got me in a headspace of like, Oh, I'm still like sad about this. And I went up and I talked mm. about how sad I was in a way that we've Love learned it. how to do it, right? Yeah. And then afterwards, it was so nice. The 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 owner or the whoever books came up to me and said, Hey, do you mind if the feature headlines and you feature? Wow. That was rough. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, Wow. I said, that makes me feel horrible. But I mean, it's you know, I'll do what the, you guys want me to do. Sure. And I was upset. Yeah. But I still went to the parking lot and I called my dad. I said, I only have to do 20 minutes now. I am so, <laughs> my feelings were hurt. But I knew how to do 20 minutes. Right. And I was joking about the same situation, obviously. But right, the, right, right. the positive version is I knew how to, and then boom, I knew how to do 20 minutes. But yeah. man, is, an, is even 50 minutes right. different than 20. But you learn something, even though it's a series of, I guess you could say in the moment, unfortunate, but I think fortunate events is because you stumbled upon or you acknowledged or leaned into something very real you were feeling in that moment and you let it mingle with an act. And I think I don't know if I call it an act, but it's a seed of it. Yes. Well, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you let that be a part of like the, and, and yeah, maybe it didn't for the, for the evening of comedy that the club wanted, right. What they were expecting. Uh, yeah, it didn't jive, but for you as a person growing in, in where you need to be able to grow as a performer, like, I think that was a, that's a, very impactful moment. Could I? I want to tell you a brag. Yeah, I mean, you brought your gold records. That's right. I brought, and there's others in the car, but we didn't even get those yet. Yeah, I these are more? just some of my minor accomplishments, and some of the more major ones I protect in a uh, small safe in the back of my Jeep. You keep your son in a safe. My son. People usually go like, you know, my career, but my real accomplishment is being a father. So I wouldn't I put my son in a safe, Rick. <laughs> this kind of comedy is certainly deplorable. I want to do a brag, and I have said this on the podcast before, but I want to brag okay. to you, not just okay. the audience. And it's based on talking about this kind of stuff. Yes. Uh, later after that, I, I had a set. I did two of these, and it's, listen, you've heard it, turn it off. But there's the two <laughs> bi big moments, like rewarding moments. Let me tell you this. Okay, yeah, yeah. It happened in, uh, on a, in Fe end of February, beginning of March, a few weeks apart, these both happened. And it was doing a better version of what I did talking about something that was happening. In Florida. Yes. Also, because it was a shorter set, and it was really something to 20 minutes to an hour. It's crazy how it's a different sport. Right. But I did, and I was talking about it on stage, and I was talking about how I was talking to my therapist, and my therapist was out of tissues and had toilet paper, or toilet paper roll, but she put it in a tissue box. Okay. And I pulled it out, and it was toilet paper, and I, what are we doing with the toilet paper? And my, I even made my therapist feel bad. And like I'm, I'm just really not knowing how to communicate to people. Right. And there were laughs enough, but it was that moment of talking, not needing to be weird. One of my earlier not needing to be weird. Right. And then uh, coincidentally, uh, the, the, as I was walking on stage and I didn't know it yet, Chris Rock walked in and you know he's going to go on next. Right. And after my set, we didn't pass each other. So it wasn't like he had to do this. He came up to me as he was like before he had to go on stage and he, yeah. he'd never seen me before. He tapped me on the shoulder and he goes, hey, to black eyes, listen, great and keep doing that and he stressed that wow, as wow. if he knew i wasn't doing that and i wasn't wow but so he, maybe he caught another set maybe he saw you do something else i think he saw that this is i'm not completely comfortable with what i'm doing yet and i'm new at it and right. that's the route to go that's awesome man and then uh uh i know i'm bragging but i feel like it's okay because i'm, I'm telling you that i want to tell you yeah a few weeks later i do another set uh in the main room and Chappelle was supposed to go on but the audience was too small so he didn't go on. And I'm sitting in the corner and uh, two minutes into the next person set. So it's been four minutes. I'm sitting there. Uh, his, his whole, him and his whole entourage leave. Right. And then 10 seconds later, he comes back in and he taps me. He goes, hey, man, uh, 
that was fantastic. Or he goes, uh, some type of compliment, you right. know? Yeah. But it wasn't like, you have to be my friend. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I said, uh, thanks, man. As if, yeah. you know, like being cool with it. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, I, I went, he was in the parking lot and I walked back and forth in the parking lot wanting him to invite me over and it didn't happen. Yeah. But I wanted to say that those two guys within three weeks after I decided to stop trying to be weird and talk right. about real stuff. Yeah. So. Dave Chappelle, 1993. Let me bring it all the way back around when we visited 93 earlier, and then we ended up talking about rain. I was backstage with Dave at a college gig. I had just gone out there, and I was like a Tasmanian devil of energy, and yet Dave was already kind of doing what we would know today as the Dave is investigating a thought, and then he's going to report when he finally links it together. And I said, Dave, I, how do you do it, man? I said... You know, t last night you did it, and then tonight, like, you know, I'm really going out there, and obviously, like... And How do you he, do what? Be calm? Because uh, some nights I'd follow him, some nights he'd follow... You know, it's like early college gigs. We're just, you know, young, you know, kids in New York doing these gigs. But what is he doing that you're asking him? He's, he's killing, right. but he's doing it after I've gone up, and I've understood from Boston, like, it's very, very difficult to follow somebody who kind of pulls the energy out of the room. And, I, and But he was just, I, I've always said this, Dave's always been great in my eyes. Dave was great when I saw him as a kid. When I was 19, what was he, 16, 17? But I said to him that night, I go, what do you think it is, man? And was, we were kind of talking shop backstage and he finally just looked at me and he goes, the power is in the silence, man. And it was like he was already dropping gems and already somebody who identified, he, he already had a, uh, some of the game plan, he just knew, right? Just some people have a the bigger picture idea and he already had an understanding very early. Those pauses and the power is being in the silence and I learned something from him that night and I immediately, even though I was still bombastic, I was already trying to find places to be able to go, all right, let me dial it down and put it back here and then I can bring it back up and go into full character or performance or whatever it might be and that was something I learned early, early from Dave Chappelle. Is that So when he sees you and he taps you on the shoulder, like, that reminds me of a kid that I knew who really wants to acknowledge when something is happening and when he sees something great. So that's awesome, man. Is the silence because being calm or is it literally like you're giving them time to digest? Sure. I mean, maybe maybe at the time of like, maybe he realized that confidence and silence, like people are, are, yeah. are at bay and waiting for, you know, they're not seeing you unsure in silence he had a demeanor even in silence that was like like that's his way of telling a story he had a way of looking down at the ground and going hmm. and you wanted to what what is he thinking he already had that right he was never searching some comics you can see in their eyes there they're searching and like they don't know it they haven't taught their face yet to not show what they're feeling feeling inside and the audience is picking up on all those little um those little pantomimes, those yeah. little tells. And Dave very early realized that going like this hmm, was like, he's got a secret. That's the way I interpret it. He's got a secret, yeah. and you want to know. I've noticed that there's something um, that you could kind of connect to doing multicam show, but there's something in uh, if, if you wait a, uh, another half a beat, you get the laugh. It gave him enough time. And if not... Right. Then they didn't. Now they're listening to the next thing. There's there is something about finding but, that. But but here's the here's the the pow moment of that is that Dave really did have something to say after that moment. It wasn't just the of course. It wasn't no, 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 no. just the 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 move. It wasn't just he was uh, like a a bad poker you know bluff. It was like then he actually had a thought that was cohesive and fucking. Unbelievable. That's why he was a transmitter, and I just did summer camp with him, and he's still a trans. A, he's a transmitter. There's something. There's something not. I think there's comics that know how to get laughs. Then I think there's a few comics that know know how to hold a mirror up to society or whatever. And then I think there's Dave, which is like those comics that something is something is coming through him, and he can transmit not just through the holding up of a mirror of this is you, that, but like this is a, an experience that we're all feeling. Mm. I mean, it's like rare air. That's why Dave is Dave. Is he the best now? I think he is. I think Dave is the best. I, I, I have a routine in my act right now that will be in my next special. And I've never talked about another comedian on stage, but 
it's me telling a story of me telling a bunch of kids about a year and a half ago why Dave Chappelle is the number one comedian of all time. Are you guys friends now? Friends now? Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Are you guys friends? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're friends. We've always been friends. <laughs> I find that, that uh, it's hard to believe, not believe, but visualize when people... Like when you're first starting out stand up, you're around these people all the time because that's where you have to be. Right. And with with success in a nice way, you can't stay at this club. You got to do the next one, or right. you only do weekends and you're not doing weekends together. Whatever it is. Oh, and right, you branch right, right. Further, for and you don't see yeah. these people. Podcasts right. are why I see comedians. Still. It's it's we kind of came up and broke through in and around the same time, so there wasn't that same intimacy of being at the table at the cellar, but. It's funny because we've always run into each other in strange places, like literally on the street in San Francisco or New York. Mm -hmm. Like, and um, for me, one of the most kind of touching moments was 2012. Dave came to see my show in Just for Laughs, and when I saw him backstage, he said, uh, "I brought my son to Just for Laughs to see you because he wanted to see you." If his son didn't want to come see you, and it was still just him. Even though you know him and your friends, is there something like, wow, Dave Chappelle wanted to go see me that you still, do you still feel that way at your level or no? Um, maybe it's different because we kind of came up together, but when Steve Martin came and saw me at the comic strip. Because he's a different generation. He's right. That, that was different. If Dave, you right. know, said, hey, I'm swinging through to see your set, it'd be great. But it's just a buddy. Yeah. That's weird. <laughs> That's weird to me. If you're like, Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying a new bit. And you'd tell him and he'd be like, oh, I'll keep an ear out for it or whatever. But but if Steve Martin said he's coming by, then suddenly it'd be a different, you know. When my peers tell me, <laughs> talk to me about my podcast, like not a clip that I put on Instagram, but yeah. they watched it. I'm blown away. Right. What are you, you're watching my stuff? You know, like that's, it's wild to me. So yeah. It, it, but yeah, I guess it's still yeah, a friend it, to it, you. It's, um, it, I think that just all harkens back to the the kid in all of us that, has our heroes, has our mentors. And when those people acknowledge, good job, that's the comment in the comment section that I want to read. If there was one comment from Steve Martin to go, that's the that's the one that you want to hold on to. Because literally, there's a few people that you're going to meet in the whole journey of whatever it is that you create, whatever. And, and by the way, if you read any like, you know, Steven Spielberg, everybody will tell you, it's it's lonely once you're in that groove. It's lonely, man. Once you once you're living in that dream like moment, is it because there are a few people? Because nobody knows how to conversate with you. Because they either think you're this, this, they think you're untouchable. They think you're different. They think they have nothing to bring to the table. They are you different? They they, they don't want to bother you. No, no. You're just at the etch, top of the echelon. The same person you were a few years back when it was par for the course. And now you're like, wow, this is harder because, because uh, for whatever reason, whatever people are projecting or feeling in their own life sometimes bleeds into how they behave around you or with you. Did people you notice that? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Were you able to communicate? It was very lonely because I went from being a lonely kid to then having built this community and, and, and you know this gang and group of people that even though I was bringing some of them with me on tours and stuff, would later tell me like, man, I not only did I not know how to relate to you or I felt, in, some would say I felt intimidated, but some felt... These are peers. Yeah, but some felt like I wasn't, um, I felt like I, I should be there or I should be finding, getting... Jealousy. Hit, hitting, maybe a little jealousy, but like just, I don't want to be in your shadow is what one person said to me once. One person said, uh, somebody that really is pretty significant, in, in the comedy world, but had a moment in their life where they, they just, it wasn't clicking, nothing was clicking. And they just didn't wanna, I remember a conversation like, ah, oh, man, I just don't wanna be in your shadow. Didn't mean to say it in like a derogatory way, didn't come at me. Was that because he like, was connected to try, you? Trying to find the words. Pe um, people said, oh, he's Dane Cook's little brother type of thing. Yeah, because suddenly it was like, you know, and you saw this in the radio days of like, uh, of like um, you know, certain radio stars, and then like there's like cronies. You know, there's like the main radio guy, and then there's the cronies. They're the people that come in, and the main guy's getting the ratings and getting the making the money and has the power to say yes or no, or you're hired or fired. And then the cronies just show up and yap, and they get like a gift certificate. And then it's like, go about your business. Very few cronies of those radio shows could turn that into a, a, a full blown career. And it was happening in like comedy. Beetlejuice on Howard Stern. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's an interesting example. I mean, yeah, I mean, 
but he did become kind of a, a star in his own right, didn't he? I don't know. I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah, no, no. It's like, and so it can be, it can be, um, it's disorienting because you think when you finally have that breakthrough moment that people are going to more, it'll, it'll be more like of, uh, like athletics, where everybody's going to be like rah rah, and we're here with all you and celebrating, and getting it's not. the same goal, and it's not. It, it it brings out a lot of unanswered questions in people, and what you find is you just start, you just start uh, gravitating towards other people that have already made it, right? Because and, and could, those conversations are uh, <laughs> pretty benign, but it, but exterior, if you were listening in or fly in the wall, they would sound so intense and exciting but people that already have had that level of success to where they've had a high and then a low they it's kind of like again par for the course where you're like i i i understand what it feels like to have been in that white hot moment and nobody feels like they can stand next to you because how are other people interpreting me now so there's an equilibrium where once you get to this point they they you kind of go through and they don't come through with you and who can they can't because they can't no, or they don't they can't they can't you can barely figure it out there's no playbook for that level you dream it you think it there's no playbook for that level of of success there's no handbook for how to um how to uh, uh navigate it could there be could you write no, that handbook no, it, no it's not possible no because it, it it's also incumbent upon like how healthy are you how how much of a great group of people are already around how much love it's a magnifying glass. You've heard that, right? Of like, if you're a nefarious person, the fame and everything makes you more dastardly and you're going to do more things to, you know. Is that because you, you don't feel that you need to stifle your, your true colors come out type of thing? Because there's no filter. Because suddenly nobody's saying no. Right. Nobody knows how to say no. And the people that love you are sadly either pushed or decide to, to, to sit back. Family? Because they, even family. Yeah, yeah, of course, because they don't know how to. Your parents? They don't know how to be in that moment with you. No, 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 no. I think my mom especially, I was lucky. My mom always had, she always had an understanding of what I could accomplish. She she knew what I would be. She told me. So to her, it was like, you already there. I knew you'd sell 30,000 people in front of. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the same stuff at 15, at 25, and then when I made it at 35. My dad could relate because the athletic side of him knew about wins and losses. Was he a baseball player? He was just, yeah, he played everything. He was a boxer, he played basketball, he went to BC, he, he was a business guy, but he also did. So he understood and he spoke wins and losses. So you gotta remember, they, they passed away when it was like win, 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 all these things were happening. They really didn't get to see a lot of the things that after that wave breaks and you're like, okay, now I'm in a rebuild. That's tough. But, but. You could, it was they couldn't help you with the loss, you're saying? No, I'm saying that it would have been hard to, like it would be to anybody to go to their parents to say I'm hurting, and then your parents don't want to see you hurting. Like my mom already a little bit, some headlines might be written, and she would call me crying. And Why do they say that about you? Dane, you're so sweet. Like, it you affects know, her more than it affects you. Right, and it was like, oh my God. Can't, I can't imagine having to have gone through what I went through of like the spanking machine and getting kicked when I'm down moments, which were to come. You don't get that pendulum swing of success without fucking like the whatever back then the versions of Perez Hilton's were going to start like, and I'm glad they didn't see that. I'm so glad they didn't have to go through that and that I was ready to go through that part of a career alone. That's what we should dig into next time. That stuff is, is there's a lot of insight there. If you want to get into like the minutia of what goes along with the next come up, which hey, I had who, after that. Why is the pendulum, why is why do the physics of this universe mean, like you said, you can't have this swing of success can't. without the kicks? W why? And, and and specific more specifically, if somebody gets to the top and they're the worst person in the world, the kicks are gonna be even more coming down. But if they do everything by the rule book that doesn't exist. Does the kick, do the kick still happen? Is it because people, what is it? What, what do you think it is that they're kicking you even though they had nothing to do with you going I up or down? I, 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 would, I would anticipate that if you're a person who is, uh, has malice and lives uh, you know, uh, doing things that are constantly knowing you're putting lives or people in jeopardy, then the kicks and stuff is probably like 
I, I don't know. I guess it would be flipped. Like that's part of the allure of being a fucking nasty person who made it. Like, oh look at look at all the fucking minions fighting under me now. Look at all the fires I've started. I don't know, but I would assume that would probably be part of that part of the pendulum swinging. I, I don't know. I know for me. What are they doing when they're kicking you? What are they saying? It Dane's not funny anymore. Dane was never funny. I Dane everything. Was, yeah, you could pick it, name it. It's like. Of course, it's, you know, you, we saw it happen with, um, you know, anybody that makes it young, a Lindsay Lohan. It's like they make it young and then it's part of that media cycle to r rip apart to see what do they do now? What do they do after we You think that's them? the thought is I want to, I want, I want to. I don't think it's a think tank group of people in a room going, all right, are we ready to write the narrative? Well, when where, someone heckles but, in an audience, they think, hey, I'm, 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 I'm changing the show. I'm doing this on purpose. I'm making right. it better or whatever. <laughs> right. Versus right, right. the silence where it's just right. like, I always knew he would or she would or whatever. Yeah, no, no. You, you, you realize, uh, you start to understand if we're talking about the pendulum thing and that's kind of like we're sweeping it into media and into our career. It is to be expected that when you're coming off a high, a hit TV show, you're on a hit TV show, you need to know when that show goes off the air, they're one gonna go, they're gonna want to write former hit TV show, blah, blah, blah. They're looking to go, how far have they fallen? Because everybody wants the, they're doing it again story, but you don't get to they're doing it again story Until unless they're... you write the, oh, it's, it's unfortunate that that was their shining holy grail moment. That's just in the narrative. You know that's how it's all kind of perceived the fodder. It's just all fodder, Rick. That's all fodder. The comments on the comment sections and the things that people write, it's it doesn't it's not real. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is if you read memoirs, biographies, autobiographies, great documentaries, when you really look at what a career is, you, you talk about the history of the performer. Is anybody talking about the history of the people who talked about the history of the performer? No. It's a good, good show idea. Let's make it. All the people that didn't make it, make it. And make we get to, sad. yeah, and we get to see why. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many things to talk to you about. And I hope you guys, we, I mean, we got into, like you said, the weeds in it, <laughs> but it's what I wanted to talk to you about, you know? I, I, this is, these are my favorite. We have a lot of conversations, like we'll text or sometimes we'll just call each other and all of a sudden it's an hour of like, it's spitfire, right? Whatever's on our mind, we seem to figure out it's a way always to- always a different thing that I always say, this could have been a podcast, but it's just that moment of what we wanted to talk about then. Right, and the hardest thing is to put cameras on and then go, ah, oh, did we live up to it? Because I think the two of us, if I, if I may say, I think we have a certain idea of how we wanted something like this to be. And I feel like this is the space I wanted to live in. I feel great about this. Yeah, I will say with this Let's podcast. Let's read the comments in the comments section. I will, man. I'll fucking do it with you. <laughs> uh, you know, the, ne the next one. Yeah, we should. We, we should, should do. do. We should do that. Um, just know if you comment something, uh, we'll say your name, unless it's bad. <laughs> in which case, sometimes when I repost bad comments, I don't like to put their name. Kind of like when there's a murderer, they go like, you know, they don't want to, or like when not a murderer, but I'll say when baseball, when a fan jumps on the field. At the baseball game, right now the new thing is let's not show them. Don't give them the credit. Right, you know. Then you go to Twitter and somebody in the and we stands wanna, is we want to see it. It's filming. It's just only helping Twitter. All right. Okay. Well, uh, I'm gonna uh, as I ask every person on this podcast at the yes. very end. There's the same question I ask everybody okay. every time. Here it is. Yep. It's a very generic Nine vague question. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Dane Cook. <laughs> I think you were going to ask me to do something like that. Here's the question. Okay. And answer it uh, personal to you. Okay. What's the difference between LA and New York with stand-up comedy? I don't know. Honestly. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Dane Cook. What is that? It doesn't, I mean, there's a lot of stage time in New York. It's great. I was thinking it's, of moving there for a few months. I, I Listen, I think you could be great anywhere if you just, it's New York City, it's validating to go and get laughs there because there's so many tourists and there's so many people coming through, you get a hodgepodge of audiences. And when you do well, you go, that couldn't have been a more mixed group of people together. I must be doing something right. I'm sure this stuff would work everywhere. So for that purpose, I love New York. 
I think LA is just as good in terms of when you get the stage time. That's the thing. Yeah. When you get the stage time. When you get time. the stage time. There's yeah. more stage time back east. Yeah. I'm really been thinking. If it weren't for COVID, I think I'd be doing it now. I think you should do it because I think uh, everybody should have the experience of performing in New York City. I mean, I've performed But there, having I mean, been there and now having performed everywhere, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that it, it's the end all be all or the very beginning of the next phase of a career. I just think it's great stage time. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like that uh, I could get a membership to that gym a little bit easier than here. Right. All right. Well, uh, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, for the last minute and a half, Dane has had a raging uh, animated boner. What? So snap it off. Dane, uh, r remind everybody where they could get the, the tickets to your show. Okay, so uh, if you want to come see me in Boston, October 29th and 30th, I'm filming my next comedy special. It's untitled. I have a couple of titles, but I'm not going to share them here. And I hope that you can come back to the show. If you can't come to the show, then you'll see it at some point. It'll be streaming, or maybe I'll just sell it on a VCR tape out of my trunk like the old days. That'd be kind of fun, right? We'll cut to a clip of him selling them in the old days. Reading comments. Music comes in. Here's what we were doing before. We, they don't hear us. It's just the music, so it looks like we're doing this. Right, and so then I'm doing this. Yes, and then... Right, 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 right. You know, that kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, Scoot do Blabbity blue Scoot 